Good evening. All right, welcome to our PVSD board meeting for February 22nd. We have translation available in Spanish. If you need that support, please see Urania Lopez. The name of traducción en español, si necesita de este servicio, por favor, pase con Urania Lopez. If someone would like to speak to an item on the agenda, uh, you must complete a speaker card and hand it in to Eva Renteria prior to the agenda item. Each item will have two minutes. Each speaker will have two minutes. So we'll start with our Pledge of Allegiance, and I'll ask uh, Vice President Acosta to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag. All right, so we get to move on to the swearing in of our provisionally appointed member of the board for area six. And we'll be, um, so city of Watsonville Mayor Eduardo Montesino will administer the oath of office for provisional trustee Adam Bolaño Scow. Mayor Montesino, first of all, thank <laughs> First of all, thank you, for, thank you for being here this evening. Um, so, you may begin administering the oath. So, I, uh, I, I, Adam Bolaño Scow, Adam Bolaño Scow, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear, that I support and defend the Constitution of the United States, that I support and defend the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, against all enemies foreign, and domestic, foreign and domestic. I will bear true faith and allegiance, I will bear true faith and allegiance to, the Constitution of the United States, to the Constitution of the United States and to the Constitution of the State of California. And to the Constitution of the State of California. And that I take this obligation freely. And that I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion and that I will well and faithfully discharge and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon my, um, on which I'm about to enter the duties of, of upon of which I'm about to enter did I get it right? Yeah, thank you <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you thank you <laughs> just really want to say uh, uh, just a one, a one thing thank, uh, thank you for giving me the honor and, and, and you picked the right, uh, the right person for, for uh, uh, the district and our community thank you And I believe we have one public speaker to this item. We do. We have one public speaker to this item, uh, Chris Webb. Uh, welcome, Adam. Uh, I'm Chris Webb. I teach at Renaissance High School. I really appreciated your, your comments. I'm looking forward to you being on the board. I uh, really feel the value that you bring as a, as a teacher. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that that's going to be reflected in your leadership. Um, one of the things I, I heard a lot about, you know, the, the environmental work you do, and one of the things that I'm looking forward to is I know on that front you're, you're keen to lead and you're not, you're not trying to wait for the state laws, and, and, we can, and you can make 
PVSD lead as a governing body. So I'm hoping you can do that, not just with environmental laws, but then also with, um, like you, you talked about retaining teachers and attracting teachers, and, and, and yes, money is important for that, but then also um, I, I feel like we as a society, not just PVSD, but just a larger society, need to reflect on um, the work-life balance and um, the demands that people have and, and being like a, a, whole, a whole person. For, for instance, I have two kids and I, I could have, I, well, thankfully my wife was able to take the day off, but I almost took a day off um, the very first day of this, or it was, uh, it was Valentine's, which would have been technically extending a, a holiday possibly, but it's because I had to take care of my, I could have had to take care of my kid for childcare reasons. And um, we just need to make sure that our policies make sense. So I'm, I'm hoping you'll bring a, a logical sense and, and make things make sense. Like if we don't have subs, then maybe we should allow teachers to, if they can, if they can do the job and they can take care of their kid. We did the form before during the COVID time where we let teachers bring their, their kids when they really needed do things like that get get some um, get some advanced policies like let's make people want to be here and let's let's make sure that we realize that because of COVID people are reassessing um, their work-life balances and, and they'll leave thank you thank you all right we will go on to uh, our superintendent comments dr. Rodriguez yeah thank you so much so this weekend is going to be a wonderful weekend for our community. So Jim Bruno, our Director of Extended Learning, has really just a wonderful experience ready for us, along with Michael Berman and his parent engagement. So we're going to have our parent um, conference, our annual parent conference. Then we will wind up having a resource fair for all of our families, followed by either roller skating or um, free movies with our families. So it's really a wonderful time for everyone within the community to learn together and, um, and convivir juntos, right? So be, be together. And so I hope that you take advantage of it. I know that Mr. Clappenbach and I were going to be at the movies with the families. Um, I had knee surgery on Friday, so I won't be roller skating, but I will be at, um, at the movie theaters, and so I hope everybody can take advantage of that. Um, and then also there's always a lot of conversation about staffing and what we can do about it. So one thing that we decided to do is to really look at why, why are people leaving. And so we had 249 people who within the last two years have left PVUSD. So we looked at, um, we looked at either the resignation form or we called each and every person to find out why that was happening. 60% of the people um, either retired, left the profession, or left the state of California. So 60% of people. Of the rest of the 40%, the two other largest chunks was 12% um, left the county, so went down to Southern California, went somewhere else. Um, and then 13% left for health or family reasons not related to work. Um, and so then when we looked at who actually left for pay, salary, um, we did lose 4%. So we lost 4% of people left for a neighboring district. So we want to, we had a lot of conversations with the people. Um, and many of them did say to us, we don't want the health benefits, we want the pay, right? So that's something that we're able to know. I did also want to note that we had 10 people who in the last two years left us and then came back within those two years. Um, because what they found was, in fact, um, they, they do have, when they go elsewhere, they may have a higher salary, but then they have to pay for benefits. And so their take home actually was less. So we did have people that came back. So we are, we're going, starting next week, we're going to start already offering contracts. And so our goal is what happened this past year is we were able to reduce vacancies, and we hope that 
we can do it again. So um, hope I see you on Saturday um, with all the fun festivities because it's going to be a great time. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to item 3.5, our governing board comments, um, a report on standing committees. And so this is an opportunity for each board member to make a few comments. Um, so we'll go ahead and start with our student trustee, uh, Morielle. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to just extend a warm welcome to Mr. Scow. Um, it's great to have you here. And um, something really exciting that I will be a part of is we're working with the research group at UCSC to develop kind of like curriculum resources. And we're planning to integrate some Filipino farm worker history into ethnic studies um, courses at PBUSD. Um, another super exciting thing um, happening soon, we're going to start scheduling interviews for the next student trustee um, because in four months I'll be out of here. <laughs> and so. I'm looking forward to seeing the candidates and there's a lot of potential, so very exciting. Thank you. Trustee DeSerpa. Thank you. Welcome everybody and welcome um, to Adam. We're very happy to have you on the board. We're gonna really miss you, Muriel, when you go. Um, and thank you for everything that you do in the community and all the service. Um, last night I attended the DLAC meeting. I'm now on that committee and it was probably one of the best committee meetings that I've been to in my 12 years on the board. It was just a beautiful thing to see um, Spanish-speaking families from each school across our district represented in the room. It was right here, and um, it, it was super interesting. Had a lot of wonderful um, presentations by district staff and by COPA, and I look forward to serving um, further on that uh, committee. Thank you. Trustee Soto. Uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you for attending and those watching as well. I, I want to extend a welcome and congratulations to Adam as well. Um, be, it's uh, good to have you here and have someone fill that seat. Uh, I had the opportunity to work the uh, CCS finals this past weekend at Watsonville High School. Uh, it, was a, it was a great event. I mean, it's, it's great for the local economy restaurants, hotels, stores, you know, with the number of schools that attended, it was all of Northern California pretty much. Um, I was uh, with the uh, barbecue crew helping out, and we probably served about 90 tri-tips, so uh, we weren't flipping burgers contrary to popular belief. We were actually uh, trimming, prepping, slicing, and serving and cooking, and uh, it was pretty much an all-day deal. I want to extend uh, a big congratulations to the crew out of Watsonville High School for sponsoring and, and kind of coordinating everything that took place because it was a real, real big event. And I hope we can carry that tradition on here in Watsonville and and uh, hold CCS finals and everything else here. Uh, I think we're in a really good location. According to talking to people, it's pretty centralized where we're at for the region that we covered and the schools that showed up. So um, we can keep that going and, and help our little town uh, earn some money and get some notoriety as well. So thank you. Trustee Scow, did you have anything you'd like to say? Yes, I'm honored to be here. Thank you, everybody, for coming out um, and, and being here, and, and not just for me, but to have a, a stronger connection with our district and to make always wanting to make improvements. That's just kind of how my brain works. and. Uh, I have a lot to learn, there's no question about it, and I'm uh, eager to be meeting with my colleagues here on the board, with Dr. Rodriguez, with the teachers, with the classified workers, as many people who serve our kids, our districts, uh, on a daily basis. It's pretty impressive, the spirit of our community. Uh, my area I'm very proud of, uh, representing Watsonville and the unincorporated part of Freedom Area. We have some wonderful schools, wonderful leadership, uh, and it's very exciting for me. Um, also want to note, uh, some of you know I am a teacher for El Sistema uh, doing after school, and uh, it's really been a, a privilege uh, to work with my colleagues. Uh, Amalia Diaz is here, our director, and this morning we played for, I don't know, hundreds of kids at Mellow Center. I, I also played with the Santa Cruz Symphony this morning, and tomorrow I'm honored that some of our students are going to be on stage with me uh, performing for more kids, and so this is going to happen all week, so this is very exciting. 
And obviously, championing the arts is something uh, I'm going to be continuing to push and build upon the good work that's been started here by our, by our district. So I, I hope you'll keep coming to our meetings. I hope you'll keep engaging with me and my colleagues uh, and uh, really make this uh, participatory, participatory hands-on endeavor. And I'm really looking forward to this journey. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee. Trustee Dodds, Jr. Good evening, everybody. Hello. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here this evening. Uh, congratulations, Trustee Scow. I look forward to working with you. Uh, I know music is part of your endeavor here, and so I look forward to your help with the Mellow Center. We could always use help. So in, anybody that wants to sponsor or donate to the, the Mellow Center, it would be greatly appreciated. Um, just, just quickly, as Trustee Soto touched on, um, the CCS Wrestling Championship was a great event. You know, from the numbers that I got, we had 2,000 people from out of town who came and, you know, support our local economy and our hotels, and we look forward to keep supporting, you know, Watson High Sports and Wrestling. Um, also, at the same time, I was able to see the Watsonville High School girls softball team scrimmage. You know, as long as I've been at Watsonville High, the Watsonville High School girls softball team has always been champions, and so hopefully we can continue to find ways to support them. I was able to attend a Gear Up event last night. My daughter received an award, but also with that, there was at least 200 students and families and so hopefully we can continue to support the Garrett program. Trustee Scow was also at the Mellow Center teaching work with the Santa Cruz Symphony with, with a lot of children so hopefully we can continue to work with the Mellow Center and support the music programs. Um, also too finally I was able to send I was able to attend Watsonville High School where they did a send off for the wrestler Denisa Nunez She's one of the, the finalists who's um, attending tonight the statewide championship, and so I wanted to, to, thank, to thank Watsonville Police Department and Watsonville High School Administration for sending her off. Um, thank you, Danisa, and good luck. Um, go Cats. And also, Trustee Memorial, I know we're working on the Watsonville High School pool, but I also wanted to say thank you for your service and always be active and always be involved because sometimes not everybody could speak up, so hopefully you can carry that on. So thank you. Trustee Suarez. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. And I wanted to say congratulations, Trustee Bolana Scow. I look forward to working with you on the board. Um, I also was able to attend the DLAC meeting. Um, I attended just to observe. I'm not on the committee, but I was interested in seeing um, what happens at these meetings and I was it was a great meeting uh, full of information and just the environment was amazing so if you are a parent at a school and your school does not have a DLAC representative I encourage you to um, try to get that spot because it was a very very warm and welcoming committee um, also tomorrow evening at Watsonville High School I'm going to be attending donkey basketball it's an FFA um, fundraiser I look forward to it I hear they're gonna be riding donkeys playing basketball so uh, come out and support FFA seven o'clock at, at Watson High School gym <laughs> well, uh, vice president Acosta. I, I was just saying I never thought I'd hear the two words donkeys and basketball in the same <laughs> sentence but okay <laughs> so Welcome everyone, good evening. Thank you for being here this evening. I'm, I'm going to do the same as everyone. Of course, Trustee Bolano Scow, welcome. Um, we're glad that you're here and that uh, your trustee area is being represented. Um, I have not had any um, committee meetings since the last meeting and we're actually working and getting, making sure we get some scheduled going forward for next month. Um, so I pretty much just have the welcome to Trustee Bolano Scow, welcome and, and thank you to everyone else who's here and hope everybody enjoyed their three day holiday weekends and thank you for having your children back in school on Tuesday. Post that. Thank you. And uh, like Vice President Acosta, this was an unusual two week period where I didn't have committee meetings. I was like, this is strange. But um, I want to echo 
uh, sentiments of welcome. So it is, it is good to have a full board again. And thank you to all the members of you know, our PVOSD community and you know, for supporting you know, the efforts to make that happen. So thank you. All right, so we will move, oh yes, we will move on to um, item 3.6, our high school students board representatives report. And I believe we have a video from Aptos High. Good evening, school board members and superintendent, Dr. Rodriguez. My name is Chase Shockmain, senior class president. I'm Jimmy Glassman, ASB secretary. I'm Sophia Cunha, ASB treasurer. And I'm Diana Luis, ASB president. Today I'll be presenting for you Aptos High School's academics. Okay, so Mondays, Tuesdays, and Fridays, we are offering extended learning after school in the library. Students can go there to get additional help with schoolwork in addition, Aptos High School is gearing for SBAC testing starting on March 20th. All 9th and 11th graders will participate in the standardized test. Counselors have presented class information to all students in grades 9 through 11 are, are preparing to choose their classes for the following school year. Finally, the local scholarship is open to all seniors due March 7th. Yeah. And I will be presenting everything about the arts that's going on. So, first of all, last just last week, CTE held a festival, giving uh, students around the campus an opportunity to see the facilities and classes that are offered in terms of arts around the school, and it went very well. Uh, also, with uh, our theater department here at the school, just last week we finished up our performances of Head Over Heels, a lovely musical, it's great, and. Finally, uh, ooh, two more things. Uh, tomorrow we are going to be going on a field trip as a class to go see Mean Girls in San Francisco. And we are just beginning our, uh, keeping up the, uh, starting the production of our radio days, our new play coming up. And I'll be talking about athletics here at Afro Tide. So all winter sports have ended already except for boys basketball. Boys basketball have a, their first round of CCS tonight. They're playing South San Francisco at Aptos High, so that'll be fun. Uh, girls soccer was able to make it to the first round of CCS, and they were the number one seed for that. And a few wrestlers had also made CCS, and I think one of them had won. But that's also over. And then all spring sports right now are in full swing. Uh, this is also the first time we've ever had a girls lacrosse team, so I'm pretty excited. Um, and I'll be talking about activities. We have our Spring Spirit Week coming up, and it's in motion. We're so excited to have finalized our days, um, and that will take place March 13th through the 17th. Um, during that week, we also have our Spring Spirit Rally, um, and we're hoping that'll boost morale and school spirit around the campus, and we have Banda Night on March 17th. Elections are also fast approaching and will take place in March. We also have our annual or er, monthly club carnival on March 3rd, um, so our amazing clubs can showcase their work and hopefully recruit new, pu new people. Speaking of clubs, we also have our mock trial team that's competing in the county competitions and our Red Cross club, which is planning their annual blood drive on March 31st. Thank you. All right, uh, and there's no other uh, high school presentations? Okay, so we'll move on to item 4.1, approval of the agenda. Um, President Holm, I'd like to make a motion to approve um, the agenda with moving item 9.1 before item 8.1. Okay, I have a first, do I have a second? Second. I have a first and a second, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries, 7-0. Uh, it's been a minute since I could say 7-0. I like it. All right. Um, item 5.1, approval of the February 8th, 2023 board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion? I would like to make a motion to approve the minutes from the February 8th board meeting. Can I have a second? I'll second. All right, I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries, 7-0. Um, item 5.2, approval of the February 11th, uh, 2023 20, board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion? 
I'll make an motion to approve the February 11th, 2023 um, special board meeting minutes. All right, can I have a second? I'll second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Great. All right, so we will move on to item 6.1, our public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the public to address uh, issues that are not on our agenda for the evening. And just to, you know, as a reminder for those of you who may be new, although the Brown Act uh, prohibits the board from engaging in discussion uh, for non-agenda items, that we are listening. So, um, so we have how many speakers do we have on this item? Uh, President Holm, we have uh, 15 speakers this evening. Um, I will call out your names um, by threes. Um, please step up to the podium. And if I do mispronounce your name, please um, feel free to correct me. Um, Margaret Rosa, Carol Wallace, and Jamila Kalenda. Jamila Kalenda. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Rodriguez and trustees. I'm Margaret Rosa. It's my 24th year as a bilingual teacher. I'm also proud to have established our school garden back in 2014 with Life Lab. Years ago, I had a bright, spunky boy in my second grade class who I envisioned one day becoming the school valedictorian. Years later, I would be writing back and forth to him while he was in state prison serving a long sentence and asking him why his life took a turn. He said that after elementary school, he got in with the wrong group, and he said that what could have helped was having adults listening to him. This year's Youth Truth Survey shows only 45% of middle and 38% of high school students had positive relationships. Those are depressing numbers. As the mom of two teens, I know of so many young adults who through this pandemic have had severe mental crises and have felt an overall sense of hopelessness. What is the answer to this crisis? I said it last year at the board meeting, and I'll say it again. It's having stable adults in our students' lives. It's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. According to the APA, supportive non-parental adults have a significant impact on adolescent psychosocial functioning. The district has shown a commitment to mental health by hiring counselors, but nothing makes a student want to come to school more than a welcoming classroom with a trusting, consistent teacher at the helm. I know why we can't hire and retain teachers. A first-year teacher in Santa Clara with my master's in BCLAD makes over $100,000 a year. Even after over 20 years of service, I make way less than that. Go to their EdJoin page and you'll find there are no classroom job openings. Lastly, the sub shortage. My colleagues dread the daily email from admin entitled, Plan for Today. Here, here's an actual email. <laughs> Today we have five absences with three unfilled absences. We will be pulling from music, science, art, and reading intervention. We will attempt to continue with our WIND data meetings. At MSD, classroom teachers have had to fill in for the sub shortage over 170 times this year. I would rather pay the district not to lose my prep time. That's how much we value it and need it to be effective teachers. The message here is clear. The most important investment you can make in our students is in people. It's really that simple. Thank you for your time. Hello. Um, Thank you for hearing all of us. My name is Carol Wallace, and I am a retired firefighter, paramedic, and fire marshal from Aptosel Selva Fire. And I'm, thank you. I currently am a fire services consultant, uh, but more importantly, or one of the most important things is I've been on the, uh, I've been associate faculty at Cabrillo College in the public safety and emergency medical technician program for 20 years. And uh, I have a success story. My daughter, who now is a practicing attorney in New York City, uh, went through the whole PVUSD program from K through 12 and graduated in 2013 um, with lots of AP classes, went to Berkeley, um, graduated with honors in economics, and went to NYU, worked for a couple years in a law firm, and then went to NYU Law, graduated last spring took the bar and, and passed the first time, and now she's practicing. So she's a PVUSD success story, and we had great experiences at all the schools at that time. <clears throat> and I was the inspector in all the Aptos schools, and I was there every year in all the classrooms and meeting all the teachers and lots of students and, and the custodial staff. Uh, what I have seen, um, so my daughter was one track. She was higher education, highly driven academically, and uh, in the Cabrillo program, 
we're looking at most of the people that come through fire technology, criminal justice, and EMT want to go into public safety. Uh, or they want to do EMT as a precursor to nursing, PAs, or medical school, or so on. Um, and so in the last 10 years, I would have to say that the academic preparedness of the students coming into the EMT program, which has fairly rigorous requirements, because you have to pass with the certificate which allows you to take the national registry exam, which allows you to be certified in a state. So without preparation, they're not going to make it. And then we need to bring back CTE programs, such as the medical technician program. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jimmy. Oh. Hi, my name is Jamila Klenda. I am a student at Aptos High School, and I'm here to speak on behalf of all the students who have been stuck using Apex this year instead of having an actual teacher. I entered high school academically behind after distance learning instead of having a qualified teacher in the classroom to help me get t up to speed. I'm stuck using a computer program where the highest grade I I can achieve is a 50% because I don't understand as a struggling student it is very discouraging to be turning in all my work trying my best and still failing because I don't have any help let me explain what it is like you start with an overview of the lesson which is five slides then you have 25 to 35 slides teaching you how to do the unit last the unit quiz last is a unit quiz it is horrible and one and it is not engaging. I am not learning anything. I'm requesting that you guys show you care about our education by getting us the teachers we need. Shout out to Mr. Gruber, who is an amazing history teacher but not qualified for math teacher. He does his best at encouraging us. Our next three, uh, Tessa Akakardo, Chris Webb, and Thad Bishop. Good evening, board members and Dr. Rodriguez. My name is Tessa Accardo. I'm a third year teacher in this district. Every day, teachers are asked to find solutions. For example, when we return to school after COVID closures, we were asked to squeeze 35 students into our classrooms on tables where they had to sit. The tables were five feet long. So I'll let you guys do the math on that one. We are sometimes asked to do the impossible. Support our 160 plus students, follow IEPs, keep contact with parents, fulfill a junk duty, give up our prep time. Oh, and also there's a new online tutoring program that the district paid however much money for so that kids can sit in front of a screen and get help from a stranger. Forget time to take of ourselves. We continue to rely on the martyrdom of teachers. We per perpetuate the trend of public education system being held up on the backs of people who continually put themselves last for the good of the next generation, exploiting their time and energy for the good of the students. You'd think that this district would want to lead the way to change that for as outwardly progressive as we like to look. The point is, we make it work. We make the impossible happen. And what are you, the board, and Dr. Rodriguez doing to help that? It's time for you to find a solution to make this district more desirable for qualified teachers. To not drive us away with low pay, meaningless programs that put our kids back in front of a screen, trying to control our personal days, threatening our health insurance plans. Without teachers, you have nothing. No new fancy program you shell out money for can replace the teachers in a classroom. We are not asking for the impossible. We're asking to be paid a livable wage and to be able to stay in the community that we love with the students that we love. We're asking you to find a solution for your teachers and your students. Thank you. Uh, good
Good evening. When when uh, the board decided to do the appointment over an election, I, I was a little apprehensive, um, but I want to commend PVUSD for the way that they approach that. Um, the things I like about it are the things I like about traditional Renaissance. Um, it was heavy in stakeholder involvement. There was clear due process. Um, all the websites were really clear about the expectations and everything. Um, there was a focus on principles of democracy. They took the time to have public comment. They had um, people able to send in comments and then they scheduled time to actually read them. So I, I, I want to commend the, the district for the way they did that and I, that kind of operation makes me proud to be here. Um, one concern I, I do have is back to my, my, uh, my site and um, I worry about like how we might get in, in between admin, we might get redefined in a way that I think doesn't fit us. So I just want to lay out a little bit of like what our real mission is. Um, we are a second chance at education for all of PVUSD secondary students. We're a safety net. Um, it would be a mistake to say like, oh, well, comprehensives, they do it this way, so that must be the way. That's, I, I think that would be a huge mistake. One thing that the, the student trustee um, spoke to that really stuck out to me was a few meetings back, she mentioned uh, at her site that students had a hard time seeing the counselor. And I hear that from kids who come from other sites. And I know like at Renaissance, one of the assets is we have our home room and we are able to have those relationships and we should, we should preserve that. It would be a mistake to in the future possibly lose that and at, you know, expand the work day and, and to not honor that we have our prep for instruction, but then we also have our prep for when we're doing all our parent meetings and we're really building those, those um, connections and we're following up on issues as they come in a way that the larger district doesn't quite do as well. So thank you. Good evening, board members, Superintendent Dr. Rodriguez. My name is Thad Bishop. I am a PE teacher at Cedar Chavez Middle School. I've been there for 15 years and I'm also the wrestling coach. I'm standing here tonight to remind you all teachers deserve a living wage. I used to teach in Madera, California, where right now I would be making $14,000 more a year after you include the insurance deduction. I have friends who have left our district to work over in the San Joaquin Valley because of higher salaries and lower cost of living. I've had friends who work in the Fresno area who have declined jobs in our area because of the lower pay in our district. As we all know, teachers' retention has a direct correlation with student achievement. I've also been a parent in this di district from the time my children were in the Watsonville Cooperative Preschool many years ago. I was shocked to see the pay scale and early childhood education, especially how hard my children's preschool teachers worked to prepare them for kindergarten. Please consider this vital part of our community's education. My final thought, I used to be a substitute school teacher before I became a full-time teacher. It was one of the toughest jobs I ever did. We need a pay raise for all substitute teachers, including teachers covering on their prep time. Thank you very much for your time. <clears throat> Our next three, um, Sherry Osterlin, Griselda Sanchez and Ron Sandage. <clears throat> Good evening, Dr. Rodriguez, board members, and especially our new trustee, um, Mr. Scow. Thank you again for attending our general membership meeting. We really appreciated that. I'm here tonight because I understand that the negotiations surrounding the subbing during teachers' pay or during teachers' preps has uh, stalled. Uh, basically, no one's budging. And uh, I realize 
that there just aren't enough subs available, okay? But what I don't understand is why mountains aren't being moved at the higher level, not us, but y'all, to remedy this problem. Clearly, whatever is being done is, is not enough, and it's time for you to come up with a viable solution for this. In March of 2020, right before we shut down, um, our sub-rotation list for our school at Pajaro Middle was four pages long. I know this because I printed it last night. On each page lists seven entries of teachers that perhaps were absent. Last night, I printed our sub-rotation list, which also has eight entries, one for each teacher that is absent. It is 14 pages long. We're not even into March yet. This was March 13th of 2020, okay? At Pajaro Middle, we have been in session for 107 days because of the evacuation stuff. We're a little bit less than the other schools. 63 of those days have required multiple teachers and administrators to cover their classes. And I want to add that contrary to popular belief, we're not talking about a Monday and Friday thing because I literally went through and counted all the days, those green highlights, okay? We have 13 Mondays, 12 Tuesdays, 11 Wednesdays, 12 Thursdays, and 15 Fridays. So yes, there are a couple more Fridays, okay? The point is, is we're not blowing, people aren't blowing off Mondays and Fridays. We have people sick for solid weeks, weeks, and we don't have subs. Ever. I'm exhausted. I'm very exhausted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, good evening. Um, my name is Griselda Sanchez, and I'm here to speak about a school closure happening next year. It is very sad um, for my family that this school will be closing. It is the PVUSD Virtual Academy. It is an option that for us is a life-saving option. As our daughter has medical needs and is unable to attend a school in person. We have been attending this school for two years and she's been flourishing. She's been doing awesome learning, um, getting all the attention that she needs from her teachers and we're able to provide that at home which brings safety which is vital this school is closing and now we don't have an option the option here in this district is not the option for us she would need to attend in-person activities which we are exposing her and affecting her health we're looking into going outside of the district to fulfill our education needs, which we don't want to do. We love this school. The only explanation we've been getting is that there's low enrollment. Parents were not asked or discussed this option or this decision was made without parents' um, knowledge. We were just given the news. So um, I would want to bring this up to you because there must be something that we can do. Low enrollment, as I, I know, is not a reason to close the school. It works for my daughter, and it m works for other families as well who are currently enrolled at that school. Thank you for your time. He's in the pen. He's ready to go. <laughs> Push that button. My name is Ron Sandage. Um, I am a proud member of the community, and I was once part of the district staff. The last place that I worked full time was at Pajaro Valley High School, along with my esteemed friend and colleague, Elsa Niasawa. When the school started, it had no playing fields to speak of. But thank goodness um, Proposition uh, or Measure L came along. 
So all those evenings that I wore this very same jacket watching the Grizzlies, football matches, soccer games. Oh, and shout out to the Grizzlies. We haven't mentioned them all night. They're playing. Uh, <laughs> the boys' soccer team is doing very well this year, just like they did 2000. Okay, there you go. Thank you. Anyway, the school needed fields and it got them, finally. Baseball diamonds there, soccer pitch, football field, track. What the school is lacking is a swimming pool and a performing arts center. <laughs> On the PBS NewsHour the other evening, it was mentioned that minority students, primarily Latinos and African Americans, constitute a very low percentage of competitors at the collegiate level. I did some research and less than 10% of those two racial groups get a chance to develop swimming schools skills. And that's the case at Pajaro Valley High School. There has been no swim team for girls or boys. One time Lily Skeel represented the school in swimming. Other than that, there's been nothing else. We need those facilities. Thank you. Okay. Our next three speakers, Anthony Felder, Christy Philip Philip Wiska. Philip Wiss, thank you, and Bridget Felder. It's two minutes per person. Right. Yeah, it's two minutes per person. Whatever order you like. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, I am here on behalf of the Virtual Academy parents in regards to the closure of the K through six grades. During the town hall meeting regarding the closure of the elementary portion of VA, there were several questions as parents had asked that were not answered, or we were given answers that Dr. Rodriguez and Lisa could not explain. The only reason we were initially given for the school closure was low enrollment. There was reference to the elementary school, but VA is not an elementary school, it's a K through 12 school. There are no laws that state that the schools must close due to low enrollment. In fact, this is a statewide problem that is not specific to VA and the size of the school is not because it is unsuccessful. In fact, in my daughter's second grade class, every single child has shown growth in ELA and maths. The parents of VA implore you to reconsider this decision and allow for the school to remain open with the possibility of one teacher for the K through six students. VA is a unique school that provides accessible resources for all students to learn. As parents, we cannot do what these wonderful teachers have done for us kids. Having a virtual program is different from the homeschool options that the district is offering us, and that difference is the reason we all chose VA instead of homeschool in the first place. There are a few other concerns I have regarding the town hall meeting. Once I had inquired about the possibility of a one teacher for K through six solution, it was immediately rejected due to claims, due to claims that the VA was costing $2 million in infrastructure costs. I asked several times what this meant and where we could find a breakdown of said costs, but was refused an answer. Dr. Rodriguez rudely left the, me the meeting 30 minutes into the meeting, leaving parents with unanswered questions and feeling unheard. In seeking out my own answers, I found that the budgets for the past three years are missing from the website. Virtual Academy has received funding for the next six years. We are not given a reason as to why we can't stay open, and it seems as if there is freedom to reallocate the money for our school, and that is what the district is choosing to do instead of considering what is best for the school children and our families. Further, only just over 12 minutes of the recorded town hall meeting was provided to parents. The entire parent comment and Q&A portion was eliminated from the recording. I believe this is a violation of the Brown Act as the video in its entirety should have been made to the public. This presented parent, prevented parents who were unable to attend to hear the answers that we were given to the questions we had asked. There was a survey sent to the VA parents regarding this closure and almost all respondents plan to return the next year and are considering leaving the district to find another program similar to VA if we cannot stay open. Thank parents you, have also minutes. provided. Thank you. Nope, it's two minutes per speaker. I, I just have copies of the parent responses. Can I pr provide to you? You are welcome to provide those. Thank you. You're welcome.
Hi, my name is Anthony Felder, and I'm speaking on behalf of VA as well. I'm just going to go ahead and pick up where my wife left off. So uh, there was a survey sent to VA parents regarding this closure, and almost all respondents plan to return next year and are considering leaving the district to find another program similar to VA if we cannot stay open. Parents have also provided reasons such as fear of school shootings, experience with bullying, and uh, immunocompromised children, mental health, and quality of education being the top reasons we should like VA to stay open. If possible, I would like to provide you with copies she provided you with. Um, thank you for hearing us and hope you implore to reconsider for the success and well-being of our children. Since I have a minute left, um, first of all, I want to start out by saying the VA teachers and principal are really good at what they are doing for our children and has always been a pleasant interaction with them. We as parents of a succeeding program were absolutely shocked to hear that it's coming to an end. I can't speak for all parents, but I know our daughter has excelled in every subject she has done because of the teaching style. It's more of a, uh, it's more time allowing the one-on-one -on -one reactions and not so much the 30 plus kids in school, you know what I mean? So um, on that note, that's pretty much all I have to say. Um, just hopefully you guys reconsider and uh, think about this. Thank you. This poll was awkward, <laughs> FYI. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm Christy Filippowitz. I'm a community, me community member that's concerned why would you be closing a school that students are excelling in the virtual academy i've heard nothing but complaints valid complaints from the teachers that have spoken today about how their schools just aren't working for them yet you have this school that's beautiful it's working for these children and it's going away seemingly with no reason that anybody has heard so far I'm close with a family of a current student that is going to be negatively affected by the closure of this school. This child is so bright and engaging and interested in science and can speak to me with eye contact. Do you have any idea how rare that is? Her confidence is coming in big part from this school. And it's just horrifying to me that that would be taken away from her. Um, I, I just have to wonder, is anybody taking into consideration what's best for these students? These kids are our future, and I know that sounds super cliche, but these are the people that are going to be running our country in a few years. And when you have something that's just so successful, it just doesn't make any sense to me um, to take it away. And it's not fair. It's really not. And these kids are going to have to seek other you know, outside of the school district, um, which is just such a hardship for these families that work so hard, you know? So I'd really like you to reconsider this and and at, at the very minimum, give the parents um, some real answers as to why this is happening. Because this low enrollment hoo-ha doesn't make any damn sense. So anyway, that's all, thank you. And our um, last three speakers on public comment, Megan Scott, Donna Lefevre, and David Morales. Hi. I am also a parent of a virtual academy student and an Aptos High student. Your teachers are tired. Can you hear me? Yep. No. Your teachers are tired. Almost every single one of them came up here and told you. Us parents are tired too. We don't have any answers. 
our kids don't have bus drivers, our kids don't have teachers. Mm -hmm. Virtual Academy is actually working for the, our students. Let parents help. And when we brought ideas to you the other day, they were shot down. You didn't care, you already had your answer. You already decided that where those funds were gonna be reallocated to and you didn't even care what the parents told, said. You gave us two weeks notice, two weeks to figure out what we were gonna do with our kids. That's not okay. If parents have ideas on how to help you guys, on how to help your teachers, listen. And when we come to you with questions, don't look at us and say, oh, I don't know if I can give you an answer because I think that that's an emotional question. That's not okay. That's not an okay response at all. Yes, it is emotional when our kids are having their school closed and their friends taken away from them. And we weren't given enough time to figure out what to do with our kids next year. It's already halfway through the school year. This is just not acceptable. Our kids deserve better. Our teachers deserve better. Our staff deserves better. Maybe you'll listen someday because you're losing teachers and our students are going to be taken out of this district because you guys can't get your head. Hello, um, <clears throat> my name is Donna Lefevre. I'm a math teacher at Watsonville High School. Um, I just want to start by saying, um, Dr. Rodriguez, you seem to imply that 60% of the people who left um, were was out of our control because of retirement or left the state or left the profession. But things that I heard from teachers that I hear from teachers, so anticipate more people leaving for those reasons, I'm going to retire earlier than I would have. I have more, I have to move to a more affordable place because PVUSD doesn't pay me enough. Um, as a teaching professional, I don't feel respected here. My time is not respected and I, my contributions are not valued. So we have control over why these people are leaving. So let's not try to manipulate it to fit your agenda. Um, the next thing, <clears throat> we need to stop expecting teachers to sub on their prep. That needs to stop. Um, Last week, grades were due, and I had to sub on my prep. My teacher colleague lost two of her long block preps because she had to sub. She's in the unfortunate position of being a fourth period prep, and there aren't enough teachers on that rotation, so they're coming up all the time. She lost both her preps. That's about four hours of prep. Now, I have 170 students. If I want to give about two minutes to review an assignment, make sure I know what they know, how can I teach them and address my, uh, the concerns that I need to um, or build them up where I can, um, two minutes to look at each kid. I have 170 students, that's 340 minutes that I need for grading, and that's gonna be almost six hours. So I lost an hour and a half, that teacher lost four hours that she has to make up outside. So I was up until midnight doing my grades as per usual, always working overtime. You're demanding that we work extra overtime because you're requiring us to sub on our prep, it's ridiculous, take it off. The other thing that I wanna bring up because I'm so stoked that you brought up the CCS uh, thing happening at Watsonville, the donkey basketball happening. It's amazing, it's a great community builder. Having CCS wrestling there was an opportunity, an honor, but the opportunity for fundraising is key. And we need that fundraising money to keep our programs going. And the way that those things happen, think about how amazing it was at the donkey basketball. Think about how much work probably went into making that happen. It's all done by the teachers, the staff at our schools that are underpaid, and we're celebrating it. We want this to continue. We want them to keep doing this. Unfortunately, as a coach myself, I know that we work way beyond what we're expected, what we're what we're paid to do because we're passionate to keep this going let's try to keep and respect these people me keeping these things going by paying them the right amount so they don't leave because we want to keep seeing these things happen in our community good evening trustees my name is david morales i am a PBUSD parent, and uh, I have a background in law and policy. I've been in this community for a long time. Um, 
I actually haven't spoken to your board since uh, the redistricting many, many years ago uh, when I was uh, active in LULAC along with a lot of other community activists uh, in Watsonville. And your board uh, kindly adopted the map that we had proposed. So I was very happy about, about that, uh, that decision. Um, the reason I'm, I'm here today is actually, I, I want to apologize in advance. Uh, I really just came to tell you how excited I am about your, your board, um, your addition of, of Mr. Scow, belonging to Scow. Um, I watched the selection process, uh, I don't know, it was a week ago or whatever. Uh, it was an excellent uh, event. I was very impressed with what Mr. Scow had to say. Uh, your decision was pretty clear, pretty obvious. Um, what was, I believe, a very positive uh, day was only uh, marred a little bit by some political comments that clearly were pre-planned and, you know, being active in the community and in politics, I understand how that happens. But l let me just say that, you know, I've been in this district for a long time. I've interviewed uh, PVUSD students for some selective colleges, really have been uh, concerned about some of the training that our students have had, some of the training that my children have had. Um, you know, I'm taking this opportunity to tell you about some of the things. Um, Latino students are tracked uh, very early on. You have these students from the time they start school. You should be able to put them into your advanced courses by the time that you're done, um, by the time they reach high school. Um, you know, this 4% tracking forward on, on the salaries, it's it's unambiguous that the teachers are underpaid and the 4% number is not credible. I would encourage you to take this opportunity to really make some changes in this, in this district. You have an excellent board and I look forward to supporting you Thank in you. any way I can and to the improvements that you can make in this district. Thank, Thank you so you. much for your time. Good evening, President Holm, Dr. Rodriguez, Board of Trustees, and welcome to Adam Scow, our new trustee in uh, Area 6. We're glad to have you here. So um, I just want to start by saying we also collect the resignation and retirement forms. Um, and I just did a quick pull up of what we had in our data from 21-22 from last school year. So there was a total of 153 employees that left our district. Out of that 153, 35% of them were retired, 11% of them were relocating, 23% of them were seeking a new job, and 18% of them listed that they were leaving due to salary. So we have some different data than what was shared. Um, I also wanna share that um, I am the chief negotiator for our, t our educators union. Um, and for many, many, many years, we've shared as a union that um, our position is to attract and retain quality educators. However, in the last few years in the climate of education, we have switched that phrase to now being the goal of retaining and then attracting quality educators. Because our number one priority is keeping the quality educators we have in this district and having them stay here. Um, as we are working through our contract negotiations, I am optimistic that the district is looking at offering on salary increases for our TK-12, our psychs, our nurses, our SLPs for this year and for next year. That is the number one goal we had to retain the educators that we have. And while the district has increased their offer for our ECE and adult ed members to 10% for this year, we still don't have an on salary offer for the second year out. And just to put that completely plainly to you all, a 10% increase for the highest paid associate teacher in our early childhood education takes them from $19.19 .19 an hour to $21.11 an hour. That hurts. 
Um, as Dr. Rodriguez mentioned earlier, we do offer an excellent benefits package, and it is something that our members are very thankful for. But we also know that our benefits don't pay our mortgages, they don't pay our rent, they don't pay our utilities, they don't pay for groceries. We also know that salary and total compensation, while is e extremely important to retaining educators, it is not the only piece of our job, and it's not the only piece of what has drived, driven many educators to leave this profession. You have heard endless people come up to this podium and share the amount of prep time they have lost, the amount of time they have had to sub and cover classes. It's just not sustainable. One of the things we also negotiate is workload. And what one of our goals is, is to limit the amount of time our educators can be asked to give that time up. Time that is vital to addressing student needs, to prepping their lessons, to grading, to reaching out to families. We cannot keep adding things onto teachers' plates. We are forcing them out of this profession. Tonight on consent agenda item 10.4, you have an MOU with Santa Clara University for a PBIS program. When you look at that, I'm sure you look at what a great PBIS program that can be offered to our students. When I look at that, I see 10 hours of training time, additional eight hours of leadership meetings. When is that going to happen? When is that going to take place? What are we going to remove what responsibilities are we going to take away in order to have time to do those extra tasks? So what I'm asking you is to look at not just total comp, that's very important, but look at the total picture. And the total picture, because what we also look at is the comments that people share on their retirement and resignation forms. And what I look at is comments like, my mental health couldn't take it anymore. The workload was too much. There was a lack of support. And it, it saddens me to know that people come into this profession loving what they do, and then that drives them away. We need to start addressing that as well. Thank you. Do we have anyone from CSEA? Hello everybody, Board of Trustees, Cabinet, Michelle, how you doing? Um, I wanna start off by saying this past weekend CCS, good turnout, good for our community, good for our kids, and not only that, just being out. Um, i like to also thank Adam for being on board now. Welcome. And also, between me and Oscar, Gus, and two other friends of ours, we cooked over 96 tri-tips. And that was all just for the kids. Adam and Danny came out, supported us at the barbecue pit there for a while, and they made the rounds. Thank you for showing up. We are a community. We're there for each other. We need to start showing up to events, supporting the kids, being exposed out there and saying here i am i'm here for you and yeah let your ear get bent a little because that's what it's about we need to work hard work hard for each other side by side hip to hip as a district as staff as teachers we have to support each other there's nothing wrong with helping one another but it ain't gonna happen if you don't go out there and do it to the two new trustees, welcome again. Thank you. Do we have anyone from Pafam? Good evening, President Holm, Dr. Rodriguez, members of the board. Uh, my name is Mike Berman. I'm the director of Equity State and Federal Programs. And I am here to build on what Dr. Rodriguez was talking about earlier in her opening. We are extremely excited about Saturday. 
Saturday, we have our annual parent conference. For the last two years, we've done it virtually. We're so glad to be back in person. Um, we have a great event planned. We hope you all join us. We hope everybody here can come out. We got flyers in the back. I come bearing props. Um, we have 14 workshops offered three times each, most of them. Social emotional supports, hopes and dreams, financial health, um, chatting under the rainbow, Mexican consulates coming out and talking about immigration and rights. Um, we have our Misteco presenters coming out. We have most of our um, most of our workshops offered in Misteco. Um, all of them are translated. Uh, we have some great information for all ages. We have child care um, across the street. The, our event is at EA Hall, and child care is at Minty White across the street. Um, we would love everyone to get the words out. Again, I have flyers in the back. A couple other highlights is I don't know if you've seen the weather report. Every day looks like rain except Saturday, right? It was destined to be, but it will be cold. However, we have local coffee provided along with breakfast and lunch. Um, it really is a great opportunity. Um, we hope to see all of you. Uh, we, we would love to welcome you at eight o'clock for our opening. We go until three o'clock. The day concludes with an hour of um, a resource fair where we have 21 of our community partners and district um, departments represented and we're kind of continuing on the passport idea we have bingo cards and the idea is that every participant gets a gets a drawing for some great prizes that have been donated from from community members and 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 uh, partners and then if you get 12 stamps on our passport then you get an additional opportunity to win things like um, iPads and Chromebooks and as was mentioned we are tied in with the um, the passport event the evening that is happening um, with Jen Littleton Bruno's team and you can get extra tickets or, or e uh, opportunities to enter with the rolling and the roller skating and the movie night and one last event before I leave you Monday is our next Monday mini and this one is specific for credit recovery um, so the the messages have all gone out um, and will continue to go out to families that might be interested in all secondary schools and especially to um, families where we have students with D's and F's. Um, so if you could spread the word on all that wonderful stuff, and again, we have flyers in the back. Um, hope to see you on Saturday um, and all the other wonderful events. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have anyone from CWA? Not today. All right. Now moving on to item 9.1 since we moved that. Um, so Let's see, we will have um, so refunding of the 2012 election Series A bonds. The report will be presented by Dale Scott, uh, president of Dale Scott and Company. Thank you, President Holm, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, Clint Rucker, I'm the Chief Business Officer. Welcome, Trustee Scow. So I'm only here for a brief minute because I won't pretend to be nearly as knowledgeable as Dale on these topics, but we are lucky enough that he was able to join us. Um, Dale reached out to me actually a few weeks ago regarding our Measure L bond that you just heard about earlier and a way to actually refinance it in order to save taxpayers money. So first thing I said to Dale was, is there any reason I don't do this? And he looked at me and he said, there's no reason you don't do this. You're literally just saving people money. So I'm always interested in saving our community money, and Dale is here to give us a presentation on how we can do that. Um, this won't be an action item. We'll bring that back to the next meeting, but Dale will be here to give a quick presentation to answer any questions. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to the expert. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. Thank you. <coughs> Good evening. Um, usually when I stand up and... Um, say that I'm going to talk about the district's bond program and how you refinance them. I pause as there's a mass exodus for the, for the uh, exit, but I will um, be brief, I promise. Um, the district has, this is just a, a short presentation to kind of give everybody a flavor of where you are. The district has had a number of attempts, uh, two of them successful, to pass general obligation bond measures um, since 1998. Uh, the ones in yellow were the uh, victories, and you can see that there still is a certain amount of bonds that are going to be have to be paid. You'll see on the next slide. Um, these are the various series of bonds that have actually been issued to investors. Um, the most important 
column on this is the one on the far right-hand side where it says next call date. That means the date in which you can refinance them. There's some restrictions as to when those might be refinanced. The one that we are considering is the one on the top in yellow. That was a $28.6 million bond issued in um, 2013, and it can now be refinanced. As you can see, 8123, you can actually refinance it six months in advance. I'm sorry, three months in advance of that date. So this is right on track. I put yellow highlight on the one on the bottom, the 2020 refinancing, refunding. That just actually took place a couple of years ago. It will not be brought to you next at your next meeting, but we're working on some ideas on how that might be restructured and refinanced also. I just didn't want you to think, well, why didn't you talk about this the last time you were here? So it is not ready for prime time, but there may be some opportunities there as well to reduce uh, the cost of the taxpayers. These are the estimated tax rates per $100,000 of assessed valuation um, for all of the bonds that are outstanding in your community. So what we're trying to do with the refinancing is lower these rates. Now, you know, to be clear, this is not going to be a massive lowering of the tax rates. It's a lot of money in aggregate, but it gets spread out among all of your taxpayers. You can see that there are still uh, seven years left on the 2002 election, and then there'll be a big drop off in 2029, taking it down to the $30. But you still have a fair number of years to repay these bonds, um, as was announced to the taxpayers when they voted, the voters when they voted on it. Oh, just one last slide on the uh, background. This is the district's assessed valuation, and that's really the, the guts of the transaction. This is the all the value of all the taxable property in the district, single family, industrial, agricultural. This is what the tax rate is actually based on. Um, they take the amount of that is owed to the investors, they divide that by whatever the assessed valuation is, and that is the tax rate. As you can see, the district has had, for the last 10 years at least, a very steady rate of 5% per year. That's, just an, that's not the housing values, that's the tax rate value, the taxable assessed valuation. And 5% is a good, healthy, steady clip for any district in the state. Okay, here we go. There is $28.6 million of this particular series outstanding. To put it very simply, those bonds that are outstanding now are at interest rates that are higher than what the current market is. That's really what's happening. So if the investor went out to buy those bonds today, the interest rate would be less because rates for those bonds, I know rates have gone up recently, but when these bonds are sold, rates are lower than they were at that time. So what the refinancing, sometimes called a refunding, is doing is essentially taking those bonds away from those investors, issuing new bonds at a lower rate, and the savings is then re returned to taxpayers in the form of lower tax rates. That's really all that's happening. In the current market, that would result in savings after all the costs are paid for the rating and the lawyers and underwriters and people like me. The uh, net savings to taxpayers is currently estimated to be over $2.6 million. So it takes simple action of the board to pass that. It takes a couple, maybe a month to put that together. If rates go back up in that time period and it becomes uneconomical, we stop. We put it on hold. We hope the market comes back, but there's no cost uh, to the district at that point. All costs of issuance is paid out of this transaction. Nothing comes out of the general fund. So with that, I'm going to pause and see if there are any questions. This will be coming back to you as an action item, and it takes a simple majority of the board um, at your next board meeting. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? No, we do not, President Hall. Any questions or comments from the board? All right. Trustee Dodge, Jr.? I just want to say that in my trustee area, we're trying to spend the, the money as fast as we can, so thank you. <laughs> trustee DeSerpa, did you have some questions? Hi, thanks for being here. I know you have to drive a long way to get home, but I appreciate you standing for questions. So the 
two million six hundred twenty three thousand three hundred and five that would be the savings to the taxpayer over w how long um over like 30 years or 27 years or over all of those years um, now sometimes it's done differently sometimes so the maturity of that particular yes. bond is 2047 correct so that it doesn't change the term in terms no does not change the term, doesn't, okay. doesn't lengthen the term. We can shorten the term if we want, mm -hmm. um, but we can't lengthen the term. So help me understand, because when these bonds were issued, interest rates were very, very low. So how is it today that they could be even lower than when they were issued? That, that's confusing to me. The average interest rate, if you look down at the fourth line, the average interest rate on the bonds that we are refinancing, and this, this is a little get into the weeds, okay? When bonds are sold, they're not sold the way you think of a mortgage, for example. You go out and get a mortgage and it's 4%, and that's the, that's the mortgage rate. Bonds are sold, each year has a different interest rate because an investor might say, oh, I want to have a bond from the school district. What's the interest rate? Well, if it's five, if you can keep the bonds for five years, it's 2%. Okay, well, what if I want to keep it for you know, 10 years? So in that case, it's 2.5% or it's 3%. So the rates usually go up the longer the term is. So of the bonds that we are looking at refinancing, the average rate is four and a quarter. Today, that same rate would be three, nine percent and it's simply because when those bonds were sold at that time the rates were actually higher than they are today for those bonds okay um, and then there are significant costs associated in refinancing the bonds mm -hmm. so why is now the best time to do it like because if we have to do this again down the road there's going to be more costs mm -hmm. In addition, so well, you can. That doesn't seem like a, a huge savings. It's well, I mean, I mean it's it something it for is sure. Two point six million dollars. There's a lot of people that will stand to make a lot of money off of this refinance, mm -hmm. including yourself. Um, and so I'm wondering, do we is now the the right time to do it, or would it be more important to wait and and do well, this at a later date and save more money? Um, so if you look again at that far column on the right-hand side, now those are the years when the bonds can be refinanced. So with the exception of the one I described at the bottom that we're working on, um, the next time you'll be able, um, there is one right below it, uh, 8123, the third one down. We've looked at that. That doesn't have any savings in it. So we're not bringing that to you. The next opportunity then would be three years from now. So you're giving up three years of savings because you're not, you're be, the taxpayers are paying those rates during that three-year period. Was your savings going to be, your, are your costs going to be completely compressed into one? No, it might be less, but it wouldn't be the same. It just wouldn't be because you have two different bonds that you are refinancing. So is this the right time? Well, in terms of trying to save costs, Yes, because I don't, you're not going to save costs. In terms of interest rates rising or falling, I can't tell you that. So $2 million and all of the tax, the people paying taxes on their property taxes, wh I know everybody has a different rate depending on what their valuation is, but it, this seems like it, it's not a tremendous amount of savings to, to people, mm. right? It's like $3 or something. No, it's in that range. Here's the way I look at it. Um, and I think it has to do really, and I don't mean this to sound glib, but I think it's the way we kind of look at costs and savings. Um, if I came to you with a new bond issue and we just sold a new bond, and I said, well, I have, I have some news for you. We sold the bond, but we should have done it a different way because it cost us an additional two point six two point eight million dollars in interest but don't worry about it because it's not it's really not that much that would not go over well <laughs> that would not go over well with anybody what do you mean you pay, you cost it cost us two point eight million dollars more 
But now you have the opportunity to get $2.8 million by really doing not much of anything except you know, your staff has to do some stuff. Can you break down the costs that the attorneys, yourself, and other people would be making off of this refinance? I can give you estimates of all of them. Um, this assumes costs of about $185,000. The majority of that goes to the underwriter. I shouldn't say the majority, the large per percentage of that. That is going to be probably fifty to sixty thousand dollars. That's for the sale. I'm I'm estimating that. There's going to be roughly twenty to thirty thousand dollars. These are coming off the top of my head, and they might not all add. Okay, but twenty to thirty thousand dollars for the rating. Legal fees are probably going to be close to seventy to eighty thousand. Our fee, I believe, is in the fifty to sixty thousand dollar range. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Do you have any other questions or comments from board members? Um, yes. I, you had mentioned um, about the possibility of also shortening the term. And could you speak to what benefits there would be into that or any um, suggestions as to why not to proceed to shorten the term? Uh, this is purely up to you. Um, the way the terms get shortened on these is to keep the payments the same for the next, in this case, 20 years or so, and just take all the savings, in this case, in that last year, 2047. In terms of absolute dollars, that's the largest savings because you're taking the compounding uh, uh, the off. Of compounding. Yes. So that's the, that's the most, um, that's the largest savings and just a pure cash basis. Mm -hmm. But there's no direct benefit to the taxpayers today. There is in the future, obviously, but there's no benefit to them today. And that benefit wouldn't be reaped until after 2045? Correct. Okay. And also, you also spoke to with regards to the, the district's rating. And as I recall, when uh, I don't know more than a few boards back, I, I think there might only be two of us here when that made the decision about uh, purchasing this building um, at a cost-neutral position. And part of our ability to do that was because of our our good rating, right? Mm -hmm. And That's could you speak to that? Uh, our district's current good rating, where we're standing with that. Well, the district would be re-rated, and as I don't anticipate any change, and um, I'm using, could be faulty memory, but my memory is that the rating is in the lower double-A category, which is a, or higher single-A category, which is a very strong rating. Um, I don't see any real changes coming up in that, but they do take into consideration actions s such as this, mm -hmm. you know, the fiscal, s fiscal um, savvy of the district, if you will. And then, of course, there's a lot of factors that you can't control, such as enrollments, population, you know, income, et cetera, et cetera. But the actions such as this do count. And how about the actions such as the, the action that, like I said, more than a few boards back when we made the decision to purchase this building, that impacts that decision as well? I think it helped it. I don't think it had a big impact, but I think it helped it because okay. it reduced your cash draw. Okay. All right. Well, th thank you for being here You're and welcome. presenting this to us. Thank and you answering our questions. Anyone else? Okay, thank you very All much. Right. Thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you, everyone. Circling back to item 8.1, resolution 22-23-35. Uh, Women's History Month uh, report will be presented by Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. Yeah, so thank you so much. So two years ago, the president came out with this new designation of Women's History Month. Um, and so since that time, so this will be the third time that we do the resolution. Since that time, we too have um, acknowledged um, National Women's History Month. 
Um, and so this year, the 2023 theme is celebrating women who tell our stories. Um, and I will just read a few lines from this um, in appreciation to um, all the strong women that we have um, within our district. So, um, whereas American women of every race, class, and ethnic background has made historic contributions to our nation and community in countless recorded and unrecorded ways, whereas American women have played a unique role throughout the history of the nation by providing the majority of the volunteer labor force of the nation, whereas American women are particularly important in the establishment of early charitable, ph philanthropic, and cultural institutions in our nation, and whereas American women of every race, class, and ethnic background served as early leaders in the forefront of every major progressive social change movement, whereas American women have served our country courageously in military, um, whereas Pajaro Valley is the part and its partners invest in the empowerment of young women through everyday lesson plans, such as programs such as ethnic studies, girls in engineering, girls who code, and other. Now, therefore, it be resolved by the Pajaro Valley Unified School District Board of Education that March is designated as Women's History Month. The superintendent is called to observe and highlight M March as Women's History Month with appropriate program ceremonies and activities throughout the district. And so I ask for your approval of this item. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Do I have any questions or comments from the board? Uh, thank, you f thank you to Dr. Rodriguez for bringing this forward. I would um, like to support this resolution by making a motion. Great, I have a motion. Do I have a second? I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. All right. Moving on to item 8.2, approve resolution 22-23-36, acknowledging National Career Technical Education Month. Report will be presented by Julie Edwards, our CTE coordinator. Good evening, um, Board President Holm, Board Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez, um, I'm excited tonight to present a couple of things. I brought a, a, a little bit of swag for the board as well. Peggy Pugh, our Executive Director of Teaching and Learning, and I were um, honored last night to receive this proclamation from the City of Watsonville honoring PVUSD and our CTE program. So I'm, I'll be sharing that with um, Eva later for the Superintendent's Office. And then also, I don't know, um, from which direction you might have come into the boardroom tonight, but if you noticed the halls of the of the main hallway, and we have some posters up in here too, these are a series of posters that we created to highlight the exciting parts of our CTE program, the breadth of it, the kinds of things that we're instilling in our students in terms of innovation and creativity, problem solving, critical thinking, and all the things that we're, we're celebrating in general about CTE and it happens to be CTE month. And so tonight I bring for your consideration um, a resolution and I'm just gonna read a few parts of it just um, starting with the, the beginning where whereas in the month of February 2023 has been designated National Career Technical Education Month and whereas more than 3,200 students in PVUSD secondary schools are now participating excuse me, in career technical education pathways, providing rigorous academic courses and real world work experience that improve the quality of their education and increase engagement, achievement, and high school completion and post-secondary transition. And whereas passions, interests, and talents of our students, they discover early in their educational experience and continue to be nurtured within the district as well as pathways of study that advance their educational and career goals. And whereas PVUSD will continue to support and expand career technical education to advance excellence in education, contribute to the development of a flourishing workplace and improve the quality of life in the city and communities of the Pajaro Valley. So I bring this to you for your consideration um, with gratitude. Um, and I, I wanna mention just very briefly that Karen Lemon is a retired PVUSD CTE teacher who was a teacher at, at Renaissance High and she 
is the photographer for all of the posters that we're seeing around us. And she worked really hard to try to capture the students in those special moments that we thought everyone would be inspired to, to experience as they visited the district office. And um, so anyway, thank you. I bring this to your consideration. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do. We have one, um, Martha Vega. Good evening, Dr. Rodriguez and Board of Trustees. Um, I would like to welcome the two Board of Trustees on the board. Um, and um, also would like to take the time to introduce myself. My name is Martha Vega. I am a teacher here at, for the Pajaro Valley Unified School District. I'm a teacher at Pajaro Valley High School um, under the Career Technical Education Program. Um, I'd like to say thank you for all the work you do. Also Karen Lemon, that I've collaborated with her in, in 10 years ago on a project. Um, I'm a firm believer in career educational program. Um, I've worked in the state, city, and county t for 28 years prior for me doing a career pivot. Having my master's degree, I went back to Cabrillo, took some career technical education classes, and did a transition, career transition, during the pandemic, um, seeing the need for, for teachers. So I am a firm believer. Um, I live here and believe in our future. Um, they hold 33% um, of our, they, our students, are 33 percent of our population here in Watsonville so it's important to for everything that you do so I want to thank you um, I'd like to also add to Ron Sandage he was my teacher at EA Hall I'm totally dating myself but um, <laughs> and he was also at PV high school oh my god I'm running out of time so let me wrap it up um, he's also part of Freedom Rotary, and I was asked if I could be the Interact Club Advisor. So I've been collaborating with him, and I totally would love to see the expansion as well of, of activities at the school. I just got back from Redwood City uh, supporting our students. Um, they were playing soccer. They won tonight. Um, can you guys, like, applaud for them? I'm so happy. Um, if you go on Instagram, they shared. Oh, damn, I ran out of time. Okay, um, thank you so much. Um, I'm also collaborating on the mural at Cesar Chavez. Thank you for having that. It's uh, creating a space for students to be safe, and I welcome everyone to help out with that. And uh, thank you. Thank okay, you. I'm out of time. <laughs> Any discussion from the board or questions? Oh, go oh. ahead. Let her go yeah, first, go and then I'll. Hello. Um, good evening. I just wanted to say thank you too for bringing forth this resolution and I was supposed to be at that meeting yesterday to for the city council and it's been an overwhelming week so I'm sorry I couldn't be there but I'm still really glad that you're here and I just wanted to share that at Watsonville High we have really extensive CTE programs like um, the academy that I'm in it's called Education Community, Community Humanitarian Outreach Leadership Academy and all throughout my past three years, I've had like CTE classes and it's like um, perspectives in education, there's psychology and I'm taking social justice this year. And they're all super engaging courses and they really stimulate like um, discussions in class. And I think it's super important and I know there's also different pathways that students can go to and it's just super um, fruitful for students to have that opportunity. So thank you and congratulations on the proclamation. Thanks very much. Any other, uh, yes. Yes. Um, I, I just want to thank you, Julie, for the work you and all your, te your team is doing. And I'm always appreciative of all of our teachers and especially teachers like um, Ms. Vega who um, are in our CTE um, program. That's always been something very near and dear to my heart. I really appreciated my early on in my tenureship of being on the board, um, getting to be our federal advocate to travel out to Washington, D.C. to advocate um, for continued um, funding for CTE programs with um, our senators and congressional leaders. And so I'm very, very appreciative of all of you and the work you're doing. It couldn't be done without also our teachers. Um, 
I don't know. Maybe that will be my new thing in my retirement because I think my retirement is just going to be a new version of me doing something different. Um, so I also look forward to our meeting this yeah. coming month, mm -hmm. right, coming up. And I can't let it go. I mean, I know someone else wants to speak. So, Thank but you. I'd like to make a motion to approve this resolution before anybody takes it from me. Um, Trustee Soto. Yeah, good evening, Julie. Thank mm -hmm. you for bringing this forward. As a former uh, Green Building Construction Guild instructor myself, I did that for three years, and uh, it was very rewarding. You know, I had my uh, student dynamic was, uh, you know, 18-year-olds and older men that, uh, you know, they were unemployed, getting retrained, or, um, you know, got a little trouble and trying to, you know, go the right way and learn a skill. So, um, you know, I, I did that for a while and I really enjoyed it. Um, matter of fact, and I think I've told the story before, I, I see one of my success stories just about daily on the freeway every day, Alfonso. He drives truck number 45 for Bellows Plumbing, and I pull up next to him sometimes in the morning or in the evenings during the drive, and I'll give a, give him a good hearty wave, and he'll do the same for me because he still remembers me. Um, so, you know, just to see that, you know, the guy, you know, he's got a job, he's doing well, he's supporting his family, and, uh, you know, these programs make a big difference. We need hands-on people. Not everybody is going to be an author or an archaeologist or whatnot. We need guys and gals to get their hands dirty, either wrenching on a car or planting p seeds or, you know, digging a hole or whatever. It, it has to get done. We, we, need, we have infrastructure that needs to get taken care of. So, you know, I thank you. And, uh, yeah, I'm in full support as well. If you have a first, I, I have a second. I, I beat uh, anybody else to that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I try you. Sorry, I'll make it quick. I'll just say I do have a son who's a sophomore now, and the highlight of his schedule is his CTE class. So awesome. it is very important to keep that in for our students. Thanks. Okay. And I'll keep it short, if I if I may. Um, it just it's been so fantastic to watch your excitement. It's contagious about the growth in our CTE programs and the new things that you've brought into the district and keep up the good work and we're so proud of the work that you're doing on behalf of the kids thank you thank you very much thanks any other questions or comments all right I've got a first and a second and I'm excited as well so I'll keep it to that but with a first and a second all those in favor aye, aye. aye. any opposed motion carries seven thank you zero. thank you very much All right, item 8.3, Comprehensive School Safety Plan. Report will be presented by Dr. Ivan Alcarez, Director of Student Services. Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. I'm Dr. Ivan Alcaraz, the Director of Student Services. And yes, today we'll be talking a little bit about our Comprehensive Safety Plan. So uh, just to get us started a little bit about our Comprehensive Safety Plan, it is in, there is timelines in which we are supposed to be presenting this information to the board. and when we're working with our sites to develop and review these uh, comprehensive safety plans, but the reality is it's a really a whole year long process because we're consistently taking feedback from our partners and those who are participating in the review and update of our safety plans. So uh, just, to, just so that everybody knows, typically the this year it started in September, so we met early, uh, very early in the year with our uh, principals to start identifying the safety teams at the site, um, those who are going to be involved in reviewing and looking at these uh, safety plans per education code. We are required to look at them annually to review and make adjustments to the safety plans. Uh, we do take feedback from our stakeholders. So at the site level, the sites are working with their safety teams that they identify in September. They're getting feedback from their uh, constituents at the local level with uh, um, our school site council uh, teams as well, and then also at the district level with um, our safety team as well. And so just uh, as part of that process, we do involve some partners as well. We do involve our law enforcement as part of the review process. Uh, this year we did have a work with Deputy Lopez uh, from the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office. We work with Officer Johnson for WPD, and then also work with uh, the Monterey County Community Services Division, Sergeant Mendoza as well as part of the process in reviewing our comprehensive safety plans. 
So once this process of review happens, it starts um, in September, goes all the way through January, and about February, they're getting the approval from their school site councils, and then it comes for a review for our district team. There is four of us that look at these uh, plants, and we do provide feedback to our um, sites if, if any changes need to happen, as well as we're getting feedback from those cons our law enforcement and making adjustments as well. Uh, throughout the year, we're also offering some trainings uh, that pertain to the safety plan. Uh, this year, we've kind of amplified many of the trainings that we've made available to our school sites as well, uh, our admin. So we did a lot of suicide risk in September. We did a threat assessment offered in October, ongoing ALICE trainings throughout the year, did our reunification protocols as well, review this year with our, our district leadership as well. Uh, so we've been doing a lot of ongoing uh, trainings throughout the year to um, kind of enhance our comprehensive safety plans uh, for our district. Uh, there is um, office hours that were provided throughout the, the review process as well. So the team of four at the district office that were looking at these plans uh, made themselves available on a weekly basis to you know, look at these plans with the site administration and provide additional feedback if needed. Uh, just a, a quick reminder, there's two parts to the comprehensive safety plan. Uh, the first part is really based on just all of the policies and procedures um, that um, very heavy on district policies and then really looking at our school culture and climate indicators. So if you look at some of these, for example, uh, we're looking at school climate uh, indicators like office referrals, we're looking at attendance rate, truancy rates, suspension and expulsion data at the site level. Perhaps we're looking at our California Healthy Kids Survey at the site and and also any local law enforcement data that may give us some indicators about the uh, current climate at our, our schools as well as our, our current um, crime. We also take a look at our training schedule. Um, we look at when they're um, having their drills for fire, earthquake, uh, shelter in place, as well as our ALICE protocols, and then looking at anything that would give us an indication of the school climate. So we're looking at our PBIS initi initiatives, looking at our counseling support services that they have in place at the site. So this all gets embedded in part one. Um, part two, just a quick reminder, um, it's not public. It won't be uh, released to the public. Part one is public. Um, assuming that the board approves it tonight, uh, we will be posting it on every school website. They'll be posting their part one to uh, the public and made available on all of these sections. Uh, part two is to be kept confidential because part two is actually uh, much more in detail that uh, specifies all of the evacuation area, has all of the maps for the site. It also indicates the reunification areas that, um, that the sites have in indicated in case there was a true need for an evacuation. So it also identifies the roles and responsibilities of the safety team and those that, are, that were involved in the process of developing and adjusting these comprehensive safety plans. So for that reason, that portion of the plan does not get posted on school websites. They, it's to be kept confidential. So yeah, so um, with that, uh, I'm hoping that you would approve the safety plans for our sites. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not, President Holm. Do we have any questions or comments from the board? Trustee Dodge, Jr.? Thank you, Dr. Ivan. Um, you do great work in the district, and I just wanted to thank you for that. I know you're born and raised, and I know you take your job seriously. Um, when we talk about ALICE training, how often is this ALICE training taking place? Yeah, so we uh, put in front of the board back in, I believe it was our October board meeting, there was a, a schedule. Um, that schedule included uh, three goals. Uh, we wanted to increase the number of certified trainers for our district that could go out and do these trainings with our sites. Um, we, do, uh, we did finish all of our secondary sites in the fall and currently in the midst of uh, doing our trainings with all of the elementary staff uh, sites. Um, we will be probably finished in about March, so we did because of the increase in uh, trainers that we have in our district now, we actually weren't able to move our deadline because we were kind of pushing it all the way to May, so that would seemed a little bit uh, too long for us, so we were able to accomplish that and we'll probably be uh, done in March. Um, so there is an official training that happens um, at the site uh, from our district certified staff once a year, and then staff that are trained uh, do a refresher as well, so it's a two uh, Alice trainings at the site. Um, in addition to that, I did mention to the board that we are working on our student pilot. Uh, we actually have a meeting uh, this upcoming week uh, to talk about our, our two sites who will be uh, piloting um, the Alice training as well. So, so you would say twice a year that the Alice training is taking place? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
And so you talk about a safety team. What is the safety? Who is the safety team? Yeah, so typically this is the first meeting that happened in September where we task our site leaders to identify the group of individuals that hold some type of skill set or level of of knowledge in, in one of the areas that may be needed in terms of an emergency. So a safety team typically uh, involves an incident commander uh, who would lead that team to a crisis if they were to happen. And then in addition to that would lead in, in, be involved would be probably a healthcare assistant or someone in the medical field to be able to, or a nurse or someone that can assist at the time. It could be our custodial staff who can assist in you know sh shutting off any power or anything that may be of assistance needed at that time of the emergency. So the task is to look at specific um, emergencies and then identify folks that can assist in resolving that crisis or assisting in that crisis. So it could be custodian, could be the nurse, could be the healthcare assistant, a counselor, the assistant principal, principal. So they look at the gamut of their uh, staff and then uh, kind of start identifying those strengths and, and matching those roles and responsibilities. So in other words, classified workers. It is sometimes also as well. Um, sometimes uh, classified workers um, support with the communication as well. Typically, as you know, most of our office staff are the first ones to get the calls from family members. So we oftentimes tap into their level of expertise and communication with, with their families. Um, another question I have is, you know, I, I know in the past that we've had surveys about how safe students, community members, and teachers feel, is it possible to do that again, to kind of like a refresher of how safe do you feel, you know, how safe don't you feel, how safe, you know, just, can we do a survey like that, just to kind of so gauge think, of where like Aptos and Watson are feeling safety-wise? Yeah, so I think what you may be referring back to is our Youth Truth Survey data that we recently, and that is an annual uh, survey that we put out just to measure this climate question that you're talking about, how safe students feel. Um, in addition to that, our Healthy Kids Survey um, also has a, a similar question that is the same as Youth Truth, so there's another data set that comes to us in the spring. So right about now, our school sites are, are actually implementing our California, California Healthy Kids Survey. So that's another data point that we can also take a look at, and that's what we take a look at when we're also developing this comprehensive safety plan that's part one, right? So we technically would have two data sets to kind of identify this uh, safety component that you're talking about. So adding an additional one, I will default that to Dr. Rodriguez and the board. Well, uh, yeah, I, I'm just curious, because it's been a couple of years, and I'm just curious, at Watson Wall High, how students in the community is feeling. That way I could listen and see what we can do to make our students and community members feel safe. And so if, if we could do something like that. And, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure how the Aptos representatives feel about that because that's, I, I'm just curious to feel what the Watsonville, the community of Watsonville is thinking and how they're feeling. So at the last board meeting I did I showed you the summary of the youth truth so we actually have that by every single school site so the reason why we actually deviated or did in addition to the um, the California uh, youth survey is because that is only a subsection and didn't include staff and didn't include parents so the youth truth we've now been doing it now for four years are we on our fifth at least yet fifth, our fifth year and that is every single child every single parent and every single staff member has access to that and safety is one of them um, actually be one of the when we look at the sheet one of the decreases was in safety um, which is why when you look at we had some positives and then we had some challenges um, two of the challenges was meant one was mentioned tonight actually was relationships so the disconnect between adults and parents um, feel like they have high level of relationships the students don't feel that so that was the one one area and then the second area that we highlighted was safety um, so we definitely can provide that we have that for each and every school site um, as well as um, the student view of that the parent view of that and staff view of that um, and so we literally just um, just put out that information so we can definitely provide it to the board, no problem. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah that was a question I actually was gonna ask too because you had done a survey, uh, the summary of the Youth Truth Survey. And in your report, we I saw a startling you know, number here, like 
students at Rolling Hills, like half of the students there don't feel safe. That hurts me. And mm-hmm. so like, I want to see the raw data of these youth, youth truth surveys, you know, for all the schools. But yeah, I mean, our kids need to feel safe at school to be able to learn. So I'm glad, you know, you guys are looking at this and implementing this plan. And I'm hoping that, you know, in this plan, yes, you're gonna try to figure out what these students are afraid of and really pinpoint those issues and try to work on those. Yeah. And um, I wanted to ask, cause I do sometimes hear from my constituents that they are, um, they feel frustrated about how emergency alerts are communicated. So, you know, what proactive steps can PVUSD parents take now to ensure that they're getting, you know, these types of communications in a way that works for them? So either email or text or however, how, what steps should they take now? Yeah, one of the one of the things that we highly encourage our families to do is to really provide the most up to date contact information to the school site. What we oftentimes find out is that they've had a change in phone number or a change in their email address or of some nature. So we typically just want to uh, encourage our, our families just to stay connected with the site and provide the most up-to-date contact info. Uh, most of our sites are using all of our systems of communication, so auto dialers typically do um, happen when there's a, an emergency or an incident on, on campuses. Email addresses are also um, used uh, through our, our student informational system as well, so that's another avenue. So if they haven't provided an email address as part of the registration process or packet, that we highly do recommend that they do that uh, to the site. And we do have uh, Remind as well, so that's another tool that um, our district uses to communicate with families as well. And, and so we highly encourage them to provide um, opt-in to getting these these messages as well, because sometimes they our families choose not to. Thank you. I just wanted to add on something. So first and foremost, and with the severity of the situation, it will actually sometimes extend the time in which we then respond to parents. So just so you know, first and foremost, the job of a site administrator is to secure the site first and foremost. So in some cases, that, it, that takes time for us to be able to do that prior to communication. And now with most students having their own cell phone, I will tell you that likely a student will actually tell their parent before we do. And often we're criticized for that, because, but the, the reason that's happening is we first and foremost have to care for the health and safety of students and staff. So as soon as we secure, um, actually, because Dr. Akabas is, is, is very good at what he does, we already have um, like scripts that are ready for us to use um, in certain situations, um, but we will not use those scripts until we have secured the site because the life of students is first and foremost and, and of staff. And so a lot of times people are like, well, I, my, stu- my child told me 15 minutes ago, 10 minutes ago. And, um, you know, Dr. Alcaves has worked with the sites to try to set a standard of we're going to communicate by X amount of time. But I just wanted to highlight that because um, likely a child will tell their parent beforehand, especially the more severe the case, probably the longer it's going to take us to secure the site. Um, and so... You want to talk to them about the timelines or your, your proposed timelines? <laughs> um, I can. So the it typically like a campus like Watamo High School when we do drills and what uh, it takes about anywhere between seven to ten minutes to secure the entire campus. So by ten minutes is kind of our mark to start kind of the first line of communication to families and those who are involved in in, in that process. So it does take about seven to ten, and I've timed it myself to ensure that we have locked doors, gates, and and whatnot in, in case of an emergency of that nature. So by 10 minutes, we should already be, you know, having some type of communication to the community and our parents. Thank you. Trustee Scott? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alcaraz. I'm very impressed with the document here for Rolling Hills, excuse me, in my area. So uh, it's a school I've been getting to know better over the recent years. And I got to say, I'm very impressed with the leadership of the, of the administration there and the spirit that's been changing there. I also want to acknowledge as everything is related, uh, Trustee Dodge was talking about classified workers being essential to this process. I just have to acknowledge that Rolling Hills is down three to five teachers, depending on how you count, and it, it's been an issue that's been communicated to me as a board trust, 
before board trustee and now as a board trustee that just wanting to acknowledge how all these things are interrelated and thank you for this report. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Oh, another question? Okay. Uh, you know, I'm not trying to bash on any safety or security. I, I just, you know, I have complete faith at the on the safety and security at Watsonville High. I, you know, my daughter goes there. I feel safe. You know, with the SRO and the health. I just wanted to be able to to see some sort of data, to see what I could do to improve on and to to listen. And you know, I know some of my my newer colleagues have this. Uh, I don't want to speak for you, but. But you know, I know they might have some different issues, and we would just like data to see. But I have complete faith that the administration and the safety at Watsonville High. So they they've proven themselves, you know, with all the guns that they stopped and all all the issues. And I have complete faith in all of them. So just thank you. Anyone else? All right. Um, I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve. I have a motion. Do I have a second? A second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7 0. All right. Moving on to item 8.4 J 13A request for allowance due to emergency conditions, school closure due to state of emergency for heavy floods and winter storms. Report will be presented by Dr. Alcaraz. Good evening, President Home Board of Trustees and Dr. Rodriguez. Yes, we are good to uh, present to you the J13A uh, form, which is a request for allowance for attendance due to an emergency condition. So as many of you probably recall, back in January, uh, many of our schools had to close uh, due to the state of emergency caused by the heavy floods and winter storms. Uh, so the schools w um, that were closed due to the emergency conditions were assessed daily and on an individual basis uh, to determine if school closure was required. So uh, health and safety of our students, staff, and families was a consideration as part of the closures. Uh, there was a set of conditions that we looked at to determine whether the schools should be closed at that time, uh, whether there was a counter city evacuation order that impacted the site, uh, counter city evacuation warnings, impassable or closed roads, uh, restricting access to the school site, as well as any National Weather Service flash uh, flood warning. So what this application does, it allows us to indicate that we were having to close uh, our schools due to a state of emergency, which would allow us to receive the same apportionment of funds that we would have had we not been closed. So we typically have a 180-day uh, calendar for our, our school sites, and when impacted, uh, this application allows us to, co to receive the apportionment that we would have if we have not closed. Um, in the board documents, you'll see that there is a timeline as to which sites were closed on which particular dates, uh, starting with January 9th. So with that, I respectfully ask that you approve the J13A um, uh, form request for allowance due to emergency conditions. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not, President Holm. Do we have any discussion from the board? Trustee Dodge, Jr.? I would just like to say thank you to all the class seven workers and the teachers who are out there during these storms. I know Dr. Rodriguez was at Watsonville High because I had concerns and issues, you know, con about flooding because there was a lot of flooding off of Riverside and Bridge. Um, all the volunteers who were out there during the floodings, especially in, in Trustee Acosta's area, there was a lot of people who came together and a lot of people's names who didn't get mentioned who were out there in the waters helping senior citizens get their 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 clothing their animals and who shelter other people i just wanted to say thank you to those and um i wish joe biden when it came to watsonville first before capitola but that's just my opinion so mm -hmm. thank you uh, vice president acosta I think it's just I want to have a clarifying question for the public um, just to um, make sure that the public's understanding of this is clear is that there will be no makeup instruction days for students for those days of school closure, correct? Correct. So this application would allow us to not have to make up those days um, at the end of the year typically. Sorry. She's got a mind of her own. <laughs> um, okay, I, and Right. And I just wanted to make sure that, that we were 
pretty clear because mm -hmm. I think there was some state of confusion about that. But okay, thank you. Yep. Um, unless somebody else has a comment, I'm willing to make the motion to approve this agenda item. A second. I have a first and a second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Thank you. All right. Moving on to item 8.5, um, approve the memorandum of understanding between PVFT and PVUSD 2022-2023 uh, summer sc uh, school pay rates. Report will be presented by Allison Niazawa, our Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources. Yes, thank you, President Holm, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez, and welcome, Trustee Scow. Thank you for being here. Um, so yes, I have an MOU uh, for you tonight. We're already planning for summer school, believe it or not, and so we would like to continue um, with the program that we ran last year and the pay rates. So this MOU encompasses the ESY, which is our special ed program, the migrant program, as well as the expanded learning program that's already been run through um, the extended learning program. So this is continuing with what we did last year. Um, we offered a per diem rate for teachers who taught in the program and then the incentive to conduct the nine hour day with the $70 an hour for teachers who stay and either work before the program or after the program, again, to help us meet the requirements of a nine hour day for students. So um, we worked with PVFT on the attached MOU and so I respectfully request that you please approve it tonight. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not, President Holm. Great. Any discussion from the board? I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve. A second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. All right. All right, moving on to item 8.6, City of Watsonville Amendment with Expanded Learning. Report will be presented by Jennifer Littleton Bruno, our Director of Expanded Learning. Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees. I think Dr. Rodriguez left. Um, I'm Jen Littleton Bruno, Director of Expanded Learning, and I'm pleased to share with you a, an expansion and amendment of our contract with the City of Watsonville. And so before you, what you are seeing is a multi-year, two-year contract to support our nine-hour day throughout the school year. It will serve 3,000 students per year minimum, upwards of 5,000 students. And what this is for is for before school program, after school program, Saturday programs, the really exciting event this Saturday, the roller skating, so for our Pajaro Passport, summer school camps, winter camps, spring break camps. Our partnership with the city of Watsonville is really growing and expanding, and our students are getting better services and more services. So I'm very excited to present this to you tonight, and I ask that you approve this contract. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not, President Holm. Do we have any discussion from the board? All right. I, I kind of want to ask if we'll be donkeys with basketballs on Saturday, because that <laughs> seems to be a thing. I was really jealous that I'm not the person bringing the donkeys with the basketballs, but um, stay tuned because I just see this as a challenge of right. more really unique, great services for All our right. students. Uh, can I have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve. All right. I've got a first. Do I have a second? Second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you. All right. Well, and going but, on. Uh, Trustee Holm? Oh, yeah. Uh, President, I'm sorry. Some 7 p.m. Donkey basketball at Watsville High. <laughs> um, so, uh, item 8.7, contract with Arts Council Santa Cruz County. Report will be presented by Jennifer Littleton Bruno. Um, take it away. Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees. I'm really excited for this other multi-year contract as well. This one is with the Arts Council of Santa Cruz County, and this one is for three and a half years of programming. Each year, we'll see at least 3,500 students. Um, what, this, what is this? Like, what are these students going to see? We will have over 312 art performances go on to our after school sites and our summer school sites. So that accounts to about anywhere from 10 
performances per school, almost one arts assembly per month in our after school programs. We have 231 year long residencies with spectra artists and classes going on. So that might be music, theater, drama classes in after school and during summer school. In addition, there are 84 year long Mariposa art classes. Those are the really cool art classes where our own high school students are teaching and being paid to teach with a mentor teacher. And so they're learning how to play a guitar and then they go on to our after school sites and with a mentor teacher, they're teaching the youth and making money to come onto our sites. So that's really exciting as well. Um, I ask that you approve this contract. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? And at home, we do not. Any discussion from the board? I'd love uh, to, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Adam. Sorry, what was, I couldn't quite hear. I was just going to make a motion, but uh, I think Adam had a comment. Yes. Uh, uh, Trustee Scott? Yeah, it sounds, uh, it sounds fantastic. And just a question, um, and forgive me, obviously I'm new. How does this proposal relate to previous proposals from the Arts Council and, and the services? Is this continuing or expanding or building? Or So it's continuing and expanding. So we typically have um, a contract about $3,000 to $3,500 a year in our old, I would say for probably the last five years. And so this year we've really grown our programs. We've expanded to many more sites and many more days and seeing more students at many of our school sites. And so this allows us to be able to serve more students on our school sites. We also, um, a new initiative that we had is that we saw that we didn't have enough VAPA assemblies, arts assemblies. And so we're working with like Tandy Beal and company and other groups to bring more artists on. So you know, in a previous year, you might have seen three assemblies per school site. And now our goal is to have 10 assemblies per, per school site. So the other thing that's different about this contract is that this is a multi-year contract. And with this, we're able to save money. The Arts Council is investing $250,000 a year of administration fees that they are not charging us because we're doing this larger contract with them. And so it's a cost savings for the district. Um, the other pieces that we're using are expanded learning funds, both carryover and regular year, and some of our carryover funds do need to be utilized, and so that's one of the reasons we're doing this contract. One more question, if I may. And how, I'm sorry, I've been, I'm missing it. In terms of which schools are, are these programs gonna be offered at? How yeah. does that? So the reason you don't see that is because it's offered at all of our after school program sites that we run. It's really important to us in expanded learning that there it's equal across the board and that all of our students have access to our education in the after school program. So we have different art classes and we have this huge spreadsheet that to make sure that each school has art in VAPA in different pieces in nutrition and health and so that no matter what school your student is at in after school program, they're able to get a baseline of enrichment activities. And so we don't share that because it is at all of our elementary school sites that we're running programs through our district programs. And then it's also during our summer programs as well. All right. Um, Trustee Serpa? So in the past, well, in the past, there, were, there wasn't after-school programs in all the schools. So this is really amazing. And also in the past, we would have to apply for the Spectra Art Grant, and usually it was the parent volunteer for the home and school club doing that work. So this is super exciting. So I thank you very much for bringing this forward, and I would like to make a motion to approve this. Thank you. Good. So I, I have a first and a second. Um, any further comments? Other than I wholeheartedly support this. It's a, it's a wonderful program, so. Thank you all. Uh, all right, so I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. All right, moving on to item uh, 8.7, recommendation of award for RFP PVSD uh, 2023 WAN. Report will be presented by uh, Rich Ariano, Director of Purchasing, and Dan Weiser, Director of Technology. Um, good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, pleased to be presenting this item with uh, 
Director of Technology, Dan Weiser. I'm going to speak to the RFP process, and then I'll turn it over to Dan to, um, <laughs> not yet, um, to go through the, um, the features of, uh, of these new connection speeds and what it'll mean to our, um, to our school sites. Um, so back in October of 2022, uh, the district issued a request for proposals for um, WAN, Wide Area Network, Wide Area Network. thank you, um, which um, uh, we were issued that for, um, for E-rate bids for um, Category 1 Digital Transmission Services. Um, on December 9th, we received and evaluated two proposals from AT&T and Spectrum. Uh, district staff reviewed and scored those proposals with AT&T receiving the highest score, 95 out of 100 points. Um, the criteria for scoring um, as part of the E-rate process is to give the most consideration to the price, so 40% of the consideration goes to the price, but other things are also considered um, the cost for non-eligible items for E-rate, um, successfully implementing other similar projects, and um, just uh, the quality of their submittal. So um, we reviewed that as a team, um, scored them, and we're bringing forward AT&T with an initial uh, recommendation of a three-year agreement with the option to add on adi an additional two years. Um, I think the last paragraph of this really kind of explains the, the, the value that the district is getting from this proposal, um, which is basically going forward, at once this is awarded and once we get E-rate funding, we still have to apply for that funding. Um, it will, these connections will be half as much and 10 times faster. So um, part of that has to do with just our E-rate application, the fact that we qualify for the highest level of discount. Um, and then taking advantage of California Teleconnect Fund and other discount programs to get the best possible connectivity at the lowest possible price. Um, and so we're bringing this forward for your approval and I'm here to answer any questions if you have any. Um, do we have any public speakers to this item? Uh, we do not, President Hall. Great, thank you. Um, any discussion from the board? I have a question. All right, take it away. So is this going equally across all schools? Every school, so this is for 29 sites. They're not all schools, right? So we have transportation is one of them, for example. We'll have the same 10 gig connection, so it'll be 10 times faster for nearly every school. Um, there's, we have three schools that currently are at 10 gigs, and those are the high schools, but they're not part of this contract. We'll be bringing forward another contract for them. But yes, every school will be at that 10 gig level. We have a few small locations, like the Buena Vista Children's Center and Aptos Post Secondary, which are such small locations, they don't really need the 10 gig, so they're at a little bit slower speed, but they, got, they have plenty of bandwidth. They never come close to even you know, hitting halfway, so. This is great. Yeah, just to you here. Will this be going to our day, like our daycare centers, or is this just to the district? So, this is the connection for every single campus, right? We connect every campus back here to our data center, right across the hall here. Yeah. Um, so every every network connection that these WAN connections connect come back here and then out to the internet. All of our uh, all of the um, children's centers and other facilities, Migrant Head Starts, and others that are on campuses take advantage of these same connections. Um, and then there's a few that are a little bit farther away that we've actually managed to connect, like at EA Hall, uh, yeah. the Watts Village. So they're actually connected to the EA Hall network, so they don't need their own separate connection. They get that connection through EA Hall. But yeah, we make sure that every single facility, all of our early childhood facilities and all of our adult edu education facilities and every other facility has the fastest possible connectivity. Yeah, I, I know there's a, a, a preschool right next to EA Hall, so I just wanted to make yeah, sure. Yeah, and they're also on the EA Hall network, so yeah. they're, they're, they're getting that same connectivity. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And that's part of this is future-proofing these connections, just making sure that they're fast enough today and that we aren't going to run out of bandwidth in the future during this three-year period. So, Trustee Pasco? Um, yes, yeah. I have um, – so you mentioned about our three contemporary high schools because they're already on the 10G, and they, so that we're not – that's not included in here right now. We're going to be bringing that contract probably at the next board meeting, is, but it's basically the same. It'll be the same price. They're just they're on a little bit of a different time frame. So is, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah. Why the difference? But it's the time frame issue. Yeah, and part of that is they already had 10 gig connectivity. Now we're bringing all the other sites to that same level of connectivity. So, and so because part this communication thing we were discussing earlier tonight with school safety. Um, 
and reflecting back to some of the criticisms um, with Aptos High and that there was some issues there with communication and, and the bandwidth. I mean, this will help improve that as well. So, so in other words, students could communicate to their parents faster that there's a problem at school than, than we. <laughs> we don't max out. None of our schools are coming close to maxing out their connection back to the district office or out to the internet. Um, so we don't have a school or any facility where the, the WAN connection is a problem, and that's part of my job is to make sure we're constantly making sure they have more than enough connectivity for that. This is not cell connectivity, so there are parts of the campus oh, okay. that maybe won't be able to connect to this if you're far down in the baseball fields, for example, or on the football field. That's not, cur that's not currently on to our wireless network. We're working really hard to expand that wireless network, and we're actually investigating E-rate opportunities to actually increase the wireless bandwidth and broadcast across the Aptos High campus. And then we're also continuing to work with cellular carriers to get cell connectivity out to that campus and across that campus. But this is really just for the instructional um, network and, and the wireless network across the campus. We've also added a lot of wireless infrastructure sure. to the outdoor areas so that when students are moving between classes and things like that, they still have that connectivity. Um, and, and yeah, that's the idea, is to make sure that this never gets maxed out, that we never have a, a situation where, where you know, the, the network slows down because we have too many people on it. Exactly, okay. And, and thank you for the clarification on that. So this still doesn't kind of cover some of those zones that kind of get into the dead or very low cell service zones. This isn't covering that, but, but it sounds like your team's taking steps we're to working get there. As, yeah, we're working to expand our wireless connectivity across those spaces, and we're working to actually get cell connectivity as well, because that way we'll have the best possible options for connectivity in, in, in all, for all purposes, emergencies and instructional purposes and others, so. Okay, thank you. Sure. Trustee Scott? Uh, thank you. Is, will this uh, cover um, problems that teachers might be having in some of their classrooms? I've heard at Rolling Hills sometimes there's uh, volume problems, uh, speed issues, is this gonna? So, I, I mean, I would need more information about uh, the specific uh, problem. So yeah. volume problem, I, I would assume you're talking about the, the clock bell paging system, and that is on our network, but that's something that we can always, okay. if anybody ever has any problem, I encourage them to submit a help ticket, we will resolve it, whatever it is, wherever it is. Uh, we make sure that every instructional space has wireless, uh, you know, a, 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 the highest level of wireless connectivity so that all st students and staff get that connectivity but this is really about getting the school's connectivity back here to the district office it's not this contract isn't about expanding individual wireless infrastructure mm -hmm. on each campus that's a whole nother project and we're always working on that as well um, but if there's if you ever hear of any kind of an issue if they can get us a help ticket we will get to them and get it resolved thank you sure can you assist us with the pg e problems in the aptos area right now I was out of power for days. <laughs> no, um, yeah, um, yeah, just so in the rural areas, just right. you know, FYI, kids and, and we, families have no electricity, and they yeah, haven't for like I, you know I, more than twenty four hours now. Yeah, I, and we we are working with PG and E on improving that process and improving the communication, and then we're also on our campuses adding battery backup so that when we do have a power outage, the network stays up as you know longer and all that. So yeah, great. and the phones stay up through those connectivities to the to the office battery backup systems. So we are doing everything we can to keep that going. That's great. I'll make a motion to approve this. I have a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. Great. Um, if there's no further discussion, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you. All right, moving on to item 9.2. <clears throat> Full day kindergarten pilot update. Report will be presented by Casey Klappenbach, Assistant Superintendent of Elementary Education. Good evening, President Holm. Um, Board of Trustees and Dr. Rodriguez, tonight I am excited to be able to present an update on our full day kindergarten pilot journey that we have endured this last year. And so I would love to start off with a quote from one of our Valencia um, full day kindergarten or FDK is what we like to refer to it, parents. So very helpful and beneficial to be in a school full day. Previously preschool 
was even more hours and to be half day would be a loss of learning time and social time. So as you can see, you will catch um, a few glimpses of some of our full day kindergarten classrooms too as we show you this journey. So up at the top, um, you'll see Ms. Negros um, from Ann Soldo, a couple of her kindergarten students, and they are actually working on math and interacting and playing what we call their math um, workstations. And um, they're actually adding already and being able to add on and explain their strategy. And on the bottom um, portion, you see a picture in the same classroom of a couple students with puzzles, having some purposeful play time. And so we started this year with six pilot schools because we are a pilot to scale district. And so it encompasses um, six sites that actually stretch and cover all of the areas in PVUSD. And we did that per purposely. And we also covered the different um, language programs. So we have our EO programs, our SEI programs, bilingual, and dual language programs across our district. Um, we also included our um, dependent charter schools as well as our, um, our regular schools as well. And so um, tonight I will cover quickly our journey and how we started off with our guiding principles and what that journey looked like. Um, voices from our stakeholders, which are so important, which we have continuously gathered throughout the year. Um, and um, thirdly, our academic outcomes. So I'll show you a quick a um, couple data points of literacy and mathematics, and then of course our learnings. A few of the learnings that we have <laughs> we have encountered this year and discovered together as a community, and then next steps and our responsive changes as we ex plan to expand to three additional sites. And so just like with our contingency planning and all of the things that we really work on in PVUSD, we, we developed guiding principles. So everything that we did within our programs, we wanted to make sure that we took it up to the limit test if it's actually covering one of these items, right? If we, had a, if we had to decide if we were covering it or if it actually was representative of the work we wanted to do for our students, um, families, and staff. And so that first one, starts with high expectations for all students, right? The second one is all about high quality, developmentally informed um, instructional programs, right? We wanna make sure that our students have calm activities to do, it's that balance, right? And those rest, rest time activities as a, um, in conjunction also with those active tasks and learning, um, learning opportunities. We also wanted to make sure we were integrating experiential play, right? Um, and then in addition, we knew, um, listening to our parents also, that they were very concerned. They wanted to make sure that not only academics were important, SEL was important, social emotional learning, and of course, language development. If we have our students longer, we wanna make sure that we're maximizing those opportunities for language development, no matter what language it's in. And then we also want to make sure that we are not doing what we always did in the past, right? We know that school, um, and education looks different. So we wanted to make sure we had 21st century learning environments for our students. We wanted to give them an opportunity to explore and then also um, develop a strong identity and belonging and then their agency, their, their ability to really advocate for their own learning. Um, and then lastly, or not lastly, last but not least, because it is our secret sauce, right? Is that parent and um, family needs and that engagement piece, that true partnership with our parents um, and really focusing on the whole child, the whole family and whole community um, throughout um, the year. So as we're moving forward, I just spoke about not wanting to do the same thing, right? And just stretching out the day. What we have found um, previously through research and evidence is that if we just continue to do the same thing and stretch it out, our students will not grow in those types of kindergarten programs. And so we wanted to make sure we looked at innovative and transformative practices and looking at the needs of our students. So we knew based on data that our students were coming into kindergarten um, in need of phonological and phonemic awareness. So we brought in um, a kinesthetic program that really is supportive of the, um, developing their abilities to manipulate sounds um, and blend and segment them, which actually helps um, um, with literacy development and it actually accelerates it. And so it also ties in and supports the SIPS, right? Our SIPS literacy program 
um, which is also based on the science of reading too. And then also adding in that the ST Math, with, which is a blended learning math program, which will support our Bridges core curriculum, giving our students an opportunity to have more of a personalized math program also. And then a real focus, like I said before, that language development, right? But through a couple key um, strategies, which works on the literacy piece with writing. So we focused on morning message, shared writing, interactive writing throughout um, our core curriculum. And then, of course, right, we know that students really do learn a lot through play. So our teachers have the ability to order purposeful play items and we went through what that looks like and we also partnered with our ECE program to make sure it was developmentally informed and so our students actually had that time um, embedded and integrated into their day along with that social emotional learning. And so we have the opportunity to add in this piece of social emotional learning that really taps into passions, interests, and talents of our students. So you heard uh, Ms. Julie Edwards talk about it earlier, right, with the CTE program. Well, we're starting it in, with our youngest students also. So there is a vertical alignment piece there too. And then lastly, that balance again, making sure that as we're, as we're waiting that balance between the active and quiet learning time for our students. For example, have making sure that we have that calming corner for our students too, so they can learn how to self-regulate also. So our journey started last spring, and so we offered the, the sites, um, all of the kindergarten teachers that were on this journey with us, we got together with them and, uh, and in five different planning sessions. And so they had the opportunity um, to go through and we started building schedules together and building this community of educators um, as a group and as a team. And so as, and this was really instrumental in preparing them for this, this year. Um, and then it also helped us prepare at the district off level, office level to make sure we were able to support them. And so during the year also, we right before the start of school, we, we offered two days of professional learning sessions that actually worked on the same things that I showed you on the slide before and that we also front loaded as part of some of these planning sessions as well. And so we hopefully we launched them into a successful year. And then throughout the year, they had the calendar for six, six collaborative sessions. So each trimester, we had a couple check-in sessions. And the really great thing about those sessions were we gave pre-check-in surveys. So we tried to get exactly what they wanted to work on and we were able to be responsive um, to the needs of our teachers. And if we weren't, we were able to change it the next time. We were constantly trying to get a, keep a pulse of what was going on in the classroom and with our teachers. And so we also did um, a mid-year survey. So you're gonna be seeing some data from our mid-year survey. We gave it to our teachers and we also gave it to our parents. And then lastly, and then um, we have our SEL professional learning sessions, which we will have a couple. Um, we've already had one, we will have a couple more, which really focus again on the RIASEC, and that's that, that piece where our students actually get to identify their passion, interests, and talents at this age, and we're able to get them kind of like introduce them and expose them to um, some career um, pathways and start learning about them. So the, this next piece is all about feedback, right? So we wanna learn from our feedback um, because we said that that was one of our guiding principles, right? And so this is the piece about our families. So this first question, one of the surveys um, questions really highlighted the social emotional well-being. So it asked our parents, um, full day kindergarten has been helpful in developing the social emotional well-being of my child. So they got to either rate it um, extremely helpful, right, which is a five, or on the other end, not helpful at all. And so as you can see, we had a majority of about 90% of our parents identified either a four or a five, right? So that's extremely helpful or helpful, right? Um, 
um, th help the social emotional well-being help the development and then the second one to your right is the academic growth right and it asked them the same type of question but it asked about how helpful full day kindergarten was to the acceleration of the academic growth of their child and the same scale right so you can see a majority again we have almost 90 percent right about 86 percent 87 percent of our parents also identified that also as being as seeing that um, it was either extremely helpful right or helpful and then moving on to another survey question that we asked them we asked them how um, how beneficial was it right to the to their child or to their family also right because again that was one of our guiding principles to work with our parents and support them and so again you see a huge number right you see over 90 about 90 percent of our parents said it was extremely beneficial to them to have that that um, full day um, opportunity and then the next question ask them about the parent family um, the um, school site partnership because we want to make sure that we are helping our sites also partner with parents and help our parents as well and so this one um, again you see 84 percent said that um, that there was a strong effort so this one was a little different it was a based on effort so there was a strong effort or no effort at all so you're looking over here um, and you can see that again we had a strong sense we had about 84 um, percent of our parents either saying a strong effort or you know there was effort notice um, notice there too and so what do parents value most? So you can see it here, the three things that they really valued most out of all of um, the items. So we had over 90 parents um, actually complete the survey. So 70% of them said learning environment was valued most, length of day, and then the additional time for our students for their social interactions and their social skills. So, that, um, so those, were, is what they, those are the things they valued most. And then so here you see three parent voices. So again, you see some of our, um, you see some of our full day kindergarten students at Ann Soldo. They are doing another one of our math workstations or um, workplaces, sorry, um, where the students are actually practicing their own math concepts and understanding and practicing their fluency at the, the same time. And they're having those meaningful social interactions, right? So I'll just read one of those quotes. Um, I think full day, kinder, uh, full day is great and makes sense. It exposes the kids to more academics, more time for concepts to click, as well as more social time with peers. And so that was one of our um, PVUSD full day kindergarten parents. And then 84% of them um, recommended a full, would recommend full day kindergarten to another parent. All right. So now we're moving on to um, our teachers, right? So our teachers' feedback is really important to us because they have been doing a lot of that heavy lifting and that, and that work with our students. And so one of the teachers said, my students have attained higher levels of learning. And so one of the questions we asked them um, was on a scale of one to five, full day kindergarten has been helpful in accelerating the academic growth of our students. And so you can see um, that 60% of them rated it a four, um, a four out of, or a five. Um, and then this is about, we have a 20 full day kindergarten teachers. So we were able to um, get feedback from half of them, 50% of them. Um, and so, as, and so you can see that they, that a majority of them did feel like they're seeing that growth. And then at this point, we also saw the same question for social emotional. And you can see just a slightly higher 70% of them rated it very high. The benefits. And then that same question about how beneficial is it to our, to our children and their families. Um, we can see a, around 60%. Um, rated it a four or a five and then we also have um, we asked them the same question about their sites making an effort because we want to know how we can support the sites if it if the teachers think it's been a struggle too and so we actually have a slightly higher we have 80 percent of them uh, viewing it as that they had a, um, a strong effort or that there was a significant effort made 
And so what did our our teachers value most? So we were, we did, like I said, we did enable them or we, were, we empowered them to be able to purchase purposeful play materials. And we provided them with a release time and, um, and instructional um, assistance time. And so what they rated the most, is, the most significant or to value of them is that instructional assistant time. They also said the, um, the release time to prepare, right, for instruction and that parent and family partnership. And so we hear some of our teacher voices here. And so we have students have made more time to have more time to complete tasks, to rest in between tasks, to take assessments and to play. As far as scheduling, it is much easier to have students on the regular schedule as the rest of the school for field trips, conferences, and for older siblings to be able to help both before school and after school buses. All right, so our academic data now, this is our Dibbles and Edel data. This is our literacy data points that we use for our universal screener. And so our goal is, on the left, we have the fall Dibbles, which is the English version of the assessment. We have the fall and the winter. And then on the right, we have the Edel, which is the Spanish and um, fall. And then we have the winter. And so we, our hope is, to reduce the red because that is the intensive support that's needed when they're coming into us in kinder. And so we were able to reduce it, decrease that intensive support by 16% from fall to winter. And then we were also in Dibbles, we, I mean not Dibbles, Edel in the Spanish version, we were able to decrease it by 20. And then the core, we want them in the green and the blue, right, where they're only needing um, that best first instruction support. And we were also able to um, significantly increase it there. And then the last data point focuses on mathematics. So this is part of our Bridges um, math program. It's a checkpoint that we take that they take during the year as a formative assessment. So at the beginning of the year in fall, after just a little bit of instruction, there wasn't much of a difference, only a 1% um, differential between the students meeting the standards in full day and the traditional kindergarten classes. But look, by winter, one of the checkpoints showed that there was an 11% differential. So if you imagine that keeping up for the rest of the year, it's almost a 20% differential to our students being able to um, to be meeting that standard. So we saw significant growth there with the math and then our learning. So now we're to the learnings and adjustments that we've made this year. The first one is we, in, um, as we were meeting with teachers and with administrators, we were able to give them, add additional yard duty time on campus. We are hearing that the IA instructional time and adult, another adult supporting them is important. We were also able to make schedule changes. So our teachers were making schedule changes as their students um, matured and were able to do their learning routines quicker. And then also that ongoing responsive pre-check-ins. So we were able to support them based on need. And then the sites were able to st start looking at how to better schedule some of their release um, teachers in a different way, knowing that kindergarten students might need smaller chunks of time throughout the whole week of that release. And so for next year, we have learned that we need to support that job embedded coaching and support earlier in the year. Um, and then we've also been able to offer um, ECE units to, through Cabrillo and a grant um, to help our instructional assistants if they want to um, develop professionally so they can support our students too. And so lastly, as we enter next year, our plan for expansion, again, we are trying to cover um, our different regions and make sure that we are doing quality. So we are expanding to H.A. Hyde, Radcliffe Elementary, and Rio Del Mar. And so I will end with this last couple of quote, or this one quote, it's the same one. We have a Spanish and an English. Um, just that whole child, whole family, and whole community um, piece. 
um, it has been a very benef beneficial for me because I work and the hours seem perfect to me because I have another daughter in third grade and I pick them up together and it has been beneficial for my daughter because I see that she is teaching herself quite well and she really likes the schedule. So this is a parent from Minty White. We started with one from Valencia and we ended with one from Minty White. So thank you so much and I will answer any questions now. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Yes, we do, President Holm. We have one, um, Radhika Kirkman. Good evening again. Um, so I did want to speak to this just because I, uh, my background is in early childhood education and child development, and it is a very dear and near place to my heart. Um, and I spoke earlier about bargaining with the district, and we also do another kind of bargaining, which is called impact bargaining. So because moving to full day kinder was an impact to our sites and our staff, we were able to bargain um, some of those impacts. And so I I've thought it was very poignant, the slide that pointed out the teacher feedback, mentioning that the most important things to them were having that support in the classroom with them, having that prep time, right, in order to do their jobs, and being able to connect with families, because those were all things that we bargained through this process for our members. Um, I also just want to point out, in the last slide, it mentions that they are working with a grant to provide ECE units to instructional assistants or classified employees. Um, we have assistant teachers in our ECE program who right now are um, trying to get pushed out by that department so that we no longer have the assistant position, but only have an associate. They already have ECE units. And part of the process of bargaining, we asked that they be able to work in those TK and full day kinder classrooms because they are trained to work with those populations. So I hope the board will consider that as it would be beneficial to both the teachers and to the students and families to have someone who is currently trained in this and in those programs. And thank you. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Any discussion or questions from the board? Uh, yes, Trustee Flores. I, I, you mentioned that this is at six sites, mm -hmm. and then and we had 20 teachers. So there's multiple classes per site, correct? Are, are you still offering a traditional kinder if a parent chooses to have that? Or if they're at that school, they are full time, full day kinder now? Yeah, so currently at the sites where we are offering the full-day kindergarten, that is the program. Mm -hmm. Have there been any pushback from parents? I'm just curious. Actually, they're, they have, they're more excited about it. Trustee DeSerpa? So there's six sites currently, mm -hmm. and we're adding three additional, and then eventually everywhere well again it's our pilot to scale right so right. we're gonna see how we how we do mm -hmm. and what the need is and we will continue to survey our families okay and then what about at Duncan Holbert do they have kinder there well currently they do have mainstreaming for kindergarten students and they have different programs but they don't have a full day kindergarten program okay Anything, any other questions or comments? Yeah, thank you. That was a very thorough presentation. Thank you. Uh, you thank know, you. I just have one more, I'm sorry, I have one more comment. And it's just that I remember when my kids were in kinder and it was a three hour program or something, it was so hard and the kids were like zooming around and the teachers had just to fit a lot in, in a three hour time period. So I love that this is extended, it slowed down, there's quiet time for kids. I just love it. I think it's a great idea. So thank you for this presentation. It was great. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to our consent agenda. Uh, these are items that are routine that come before the board. Um, do we have any public speakers for our consent agenda? We do not, President Holm. Are there any items that the board wishes to defer? I will entertain a motion. Make a motion to approve our consent agenda tonight. I have a first. Do I have a second? Okay. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. 
Any opposed? Motion carries 601. Um, moving on to item 13.1. Um, are there any items to report from closed session? Yes, um, we do have some items to report out of closed session. Okay. Um, okay. Under closed session agenda item 2.1, I move to approve the recommendation of the district administration of a full expulsion for one year for student number 2223005 and a suspended expulsion for the remainder of the academic year for student number 222306. Do need a second? A second. Yeah, so um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Aye. Yes, yes. So, um, Motion carries five zero one one. Okay, just making sure I've got my count right. Okay, all right. Next item. Yes, um, I move to approve the certificated personnel report as presented by the district administration on February twenty second, twenty twenty two, with twenty four and thirteen additional action items. Did I say that was two point two? I'm sorry. Did I say that? Yes. Yes. I'll second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Um, any opposed? Any abstaining? Okay. Five uh, zero one one. Are, are you? Okay. Mm -hmm. So five zero one one. Under closed session item 2.3, I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by district administration on February 22nd, 2022, with 15 and six additional action items. A second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? Motion carries 5011. <coughs> On closed session item 2.6 regarding resolution number 222333, the board approved the possible released re release, reassignment, and non re election of the following certificated management employees number 1220, number 1223, number 6974, number 8428, number 2425, number 4. The 950, number 2950, number 9152, number 4970, and number 6119. That was voted on earlier. I told you we need to report out what it was, right? It was, um, <laughs> it was, yeah, 501, sorry. Out of five zero one. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and that is it for me. Great. Okay. Our next regular board meeting will be on March eighth, uh, twenty twenty three, and the meeting is adjourned at ten o'clock exactly. No, the